I've talked about this so many times, but it seems to be, this isn't true in every single case, but a lot of what I consider to be the greatest movies of all time, the first scene is super important for uh, several reasons, but one of the main ones is that it's going to be the whole story in microcosm. It's going to be making a very distinct point. It's going to be a hook and it's going to be, uh, you know, something that kicks everything off, so to speak. And I feel like this is one that qualifies quite a bit. Like, what what is happening in our opening? And it's like, oh, well, it's the park, you know, getting up to probably some kind of regular uh, operation, being moving of a dinosaur from one place to another. And you have um, shit tons of men, loads of technology, and all kinds of orders and security and weapons everywhere. And um, they're just trying to move a velociraptor into an enclosure. That is it. Right. And the way that this is built and shot, it's animals. a, it's it's like it's like a horror movie. And the score, yes, yeah. which we John can't play you guys, but, but trust you haven't us. heard the, <laughs> yeah, you haven't heard the theme yet. No, it's great. Um, the score is Jay very is doing it once again. I feel like everybody's had to have heard the uh, the theme. Everyone's so heard like, it, like, even if they don't know so what it's like from. Like, everyone's yeah. heard it. Well, it's I mean, the, the the great thing about John Williams is is one of the things he's not necessarily known for is his horror scores i had remembered it as there were no shots of the dinosaur it was only on the rewatch that so i was like ah oh, there is one like the, yeah that's kind of clean enough and i think obviously it's spielberg having the close-up of uh of muldoon and then the velociraptor like this lock of man versus nature which yeah is uh entirely what i believe this scene is is pretty much about look at the amount of man-made tech that's here even like the the tint of blue around here, which comes across to me as you know, like green versus blue is a lot of what it can be for tech versus nature, depending on your choices, of course. I like to look into these things when it's a movie this good, and um, yeah, like what is the big thing that fucks all of this up is they underestimate the Velociraptor's strength. Pretty much that. Yes, is. and then of course it, the the Velociraptor's fundamental inability to understand like what they're even trying to do. Like, he doesn't know, like, oh, yeah, this is them putting me... Like, it's it's an animal, right? Who didn't yeah. live with humans? Uh, and it's just this fundamental clash of, like, these creatures that didn't coexist and shouldn't coexist, really. Well, yeah, there's there's no... Uh, that's the whole chaos element. There's so much that you could never possibly be prepared for or understand. Um, that's what the warning well, of this film is. to control them? Yeah, like, the, 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 the expecting that you can control them, like, it's just an illusion... And uh, yeah, this is obviously one of the big first examples of how ill-prepared this park is. It, uh, you'll have Hammond yeah. telling you throughout, no, it's fine, it's good, it's great, everything's paid for, it's all good, 100% it's going to work. And it's just like we keep seeing <laughs> all of these aspects failing, which is really important to allow the plotline to happen. The fact that this is an ill-prepared state of, of park, but at the same time, it's uh, it's not something they've put zero money or effort into. It's just uh, the all amount... Right. The sheer the level of power point. you need to be able to outclass the power that you're generating is uh, big old themes in this film. Yep. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's good for a hook because you. <laughs> it's kind of funny looking back on it, like because uh, now the the problem with the newer films is they think like one Velociraptor is boring, one T Rex is boring. We need we need the hyper genetically I... altered super mutant dinosaur that can fly, go invisible, evade uh, X rays and stuff. Of... It's kind of interesting how much you can trace that with other franchises running at the same time, like with Terminator. Bigger, with T bigger, T bigger, more. Boring. We can't just have a T-800. It's got to be like a hyper, like it's got its own magnetic field and everything, and it can like fly and shit. You know, and then we like got time travel, better. and then we got get different. It up. And you see like that the, with um, the... Predator as well. The new cool Predator. Yeah, he was bulletproof. Exactly. He was super big, tall, strong, invisible, running around wild, killing people, everybody in the forest, and everyone's just shooting their guns and exploding everything. And it's like... Feel like you didn't grasp at all what made these films so popular but all right it's no. something that you can't help but recognize over and over when you're watching this movie is how small scale and intimate a lot of these tense encounters are it's literally just a velociraptor in a kitchen with some kids and you're like oh shit it's just it's just like one or two or it's a single t-rex fucking around with a couple ford explorers you know like and yet it's it's terrifying it's really scary and, it, and it's got a lot of tension there's not these insane explosions going off and these massive well, yeah, dinosaur like stampedes exploding volcanoes a million like pterodactyls flying around grabbing people 
it's just yeah, too and, much. And, and You're as, just like, I just don't, my brain just can't believe this. It's so much happening. But a velociraptor in a, chasing me in a kitchen, I can imagine that. I can believe that. That's why it's so scary. Nice and straightforward, nice and terrifying. As uh, Thunder just referenced, yeah, the 1,000 Star Destroyer Death Stars. It's like, what? Yeah, that's a pretty good example. That might just, be the best example because um, that sounds like a joke. It's yeah, meme. you know what these are. What if there were a thousand of them? Ooh, oh, yeah. aren't it's, you it's scared? Not even, it's, it's not even as creative as, like, trying to create new crazy dinosaurs. It's just copy-paste, like, the thing that you remember, you know, from the old, better films. So, yeah, the, the to me, the, the first scene is, like, a big old, uh, as I said, hook and a, a focus on thematically what we're going to be dealing with. Next scene is almost strictly plot. You still get character in all of these because obviously that's where the information is coming from. But it's like lawyer arrives on what is a really like dinky and strange method without a uh, welcoming from Hammond because uh, it just represents how much he's not favored. This is um this is the lower end of the the the, the character in terms of value. Nobody likes the lawyer. <laughs> he's uh, he's kind of annoying. He's very focused on money. He's kind of an idiot too. He has many lines that relate to him just man being like he just doesn't understand much of anything um out of his element here absolutely but obviously he represents a very important part of the film and um yeah they basically just explain the the park is being built and a lot of insurance guys and other investors are not sure they they might want to axe the program because it just seems too uh unruly sort of thing they need reassurances from experts you're gonna have to grab uh some one of them that has been suggested as a more trendy one to get a um an approval from is is Ian Malcolm, and then he's like uh, he's looking for some others more classic uh, types, being the archaeologists that are currently under um, Ammon's uh, sort of money right now. He's funding their um, current expedition, right? He said he and and, and he's going to look to do it further if they agree to this, because I guess Hammond at this point is quite rich, but Jurassic Park is still going to cost you a shit ton. Yeah. And um, yeah, so this is just making clear that um, that is going to be why everything is happening. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things you would expect would happen. And uh, to be honest with you, it wouldn't be long before there would be a hell of a lot of government intervention with the more knowledge of this place getting uh, further and further well known. Um, yeah, and ending with a big old shot of the mosquito in amber. Yeah, the... which uh, is nice in terms of a level of symbolism, ain't it? Every time, yeah. yeah. And then next scene already, it's just like we're, we're what going. What happens to bloodsuckers? And uh, we, Alan and Ellie are just uh, organizing well, just their architectural let's dig. Up. It's just let's sort of set up expectations in your mind about these two characters because it's all just character, right? Them yeah. at the dig site. Who are these people? Um, and and of course, you know, brought forth through the performance as well. You just get a really clear sense of these as individuals, you know, rather than just uh, people who have been plopped into like a dinosaur movie. Well, what's Alan's first line? I hate computers. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of references in this film to him being almost incompatible with technology, and uh, I've always seen it as a, a symbolic again of him. Uh, being more in tune with nature well, than tech. Because he mentions, um, he mentions that when they're using the computer to basically like map out the area so that they can find all of the bones. I think he said something along the lines of like, "Well, what's the fun in that?" Basically, the fun comes from digging. Or like, what's the point of digging anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the fun in that? And as he points to it, it uh, goes staticky, and I think she says like, "He's uh, Doctor Grant isn't machine compatible," and mm. yeah, just uh, the. Continuing themes of the excess technology or new advancements in technology and man versus nature. The Grant throughout this film seems to be the primary character that respects and understands everything that's happening on a more fundamental level and uh, what's ethical, what we shouldn't be doing, but doesn't necessarily like start up big old debates about it. He's just, um, he's always acting in the interest of trying to make sure everything works out. Cause like, you know, that, that comes into full clear when, uh, they're talking in the um when they're having lunch he's like the last one to give his opinion well yeah he's uh i mean he's um attenborough appeals to him is like you know come on like surely you you know you, you know what's up right this is all great isn't it mm -hmm. well that's Grant's a lot like, to talk yeah, about I don't know that. 
that scene is uh rich thematically well uh yeah because like the next thing that significance that happens is uh, alan grant terrifying a child uh in the best way possible instantly makes him my favorite character <laughs> he's alan grant stocks instantly rise well it's, uh, it is great because this yeah what seven eight minutes in and uh this is the big setup for what dealing with a raptor is like and uh this film, because I don't know how accurate it would be necessarily to uh, what we know about raptors compared to other dinosaurs, but this film kind of makes raptors seem like the most threatening dinosaur that's ever existed. Like, uh, and which we don't is um, fuck with kind them. of interesting, right? Because with T Rex, everybody knows what the T Rex is. Uh, it kind of like speaks for itself. Um, whereas building up Velociraptors, yeah, it seems like this film kind of that was a goal was to build them up to to the point that they're the final set piece. The T Rex is kind of the first set piece of the movie. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it comes from the Velociraptors uh, sort of building up their intelligence and their coordination. Um, yeah, so they, they do a good so job better. at sort of displaying different kinds of danger. The T Rex yeah, exactly. isn't the same kind of dangerous as a Velociraptor is, but they're both very dangerous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dr. Grant destroys kid with facts and logic. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Debate one. Because, yeah, the kid is basically like, ha, they sound like chickens and idiots. They it looks like a chicken. Yeah, and then Grant is like, like wow. you know what's so neat about them? And th th he throws in the line, by the way, you may expect that they're like, T-Rex is where if you stay still, you'll be okay. Um, so that's just going to be helpful for later when that's re-implemented. But uh, he says, no, it'll be staring at you, and you'll be staring at it, and then you'll be attacked. But not from the front, from the sides. They, uh... They hunt together. They use coordinated attack patterns. And oh, it isn't just they it, eat not you from alive. The front, from the side, not from the front, from the side. And then what happens? What happens to your boy Muldoon? That's the thing. You could you, you know? could uh, mix the two scenes together, and uh... there's a lot of setup and payoff in this film. They build up so many things that come back uh, to to be leveraged in the story later on. It's really good stuff. Uh, and yeah, and then they have the little chat about kids. He's uh, on a more character, like, fundamental level. He goes through a little arc in this about dealing with children, finds them all to be rather annoying, and yet is probably one of the best carers of the children in the whole movie, compared yeah. to most characters. <laughs> when push comes to shove, you know, he, he leaps into the fray, and he does what he thinks is right, or he, do, he does his best, you know? Hammond would probably say he definitely respects this dig, he's paying for it and all that stuff, but he doesn't um, treat it properly, which is representative no. of his park. It's like, it's like it's there, but not there fully. He doesn't fully understand what he's dealing with. What is this place, and why should you be giving it more care? And he's just like, well, it's, you know, it's where they dig up the bones. And then they, that, well, that's how they find out about the dinosaurs. Kind of the same as uh, like when people it's like oh that animal that wild animal oh I want to pet him and squeeze him and everything it's like why don't you just leave it alone <laughs> you know like why don't you just respect it from a distance it's kind of like that like, yeah the considerate thing to do would be land further away and walk here but <laughs> oh well and uh, yeah you have the sufficient outrage from uh, Alan and Ellie but then they both realize oh this is the guy who's funding us right. And, uh, yeah, I, and their immediate pivot in their demeanor. <laughs> I really love uh, Richard Attenborough throughout this film, by the way. He's so oh, joyful. Yeah. And, uh, he's so charming. Yeah, he's so much fun and everything, but this just that underlying, like, he knows all of this is holding together with just strings. And uh, he's so desperate to get it to the world. He's so desperate to give people the experiences he wants to see. His enjoyment almost comes directly from other people being, like, in awe of the stuff that he can show them. Um. Kind of reminds me of Prestige, actually. Yeah, it was a look on their faces. And uh, Yeah, it's a really... He's very, very unique in, in the whole storyline for his point of view. That's that's what he's motivated by. But at the same time, he'll have a crossover with lots of different characters at lots of different times. Because uh, that's the thing, right? Like, everyone's core values are different, but they'll all intersect at different points. It creates for really good banter, bouncing, and... Because, uh, like, this would be a good example, right? Those two are outraged at what he's done to the dig until they find out he's funding it. And then they're like, no, we're not going to come to your crazy whatever the hell this is. And he's like, I'll give you lots of money. And they're like, okay. Fund your dig for the <laughs> next three years. Like, yeah, that'd be... Uh, money is a... It's a thing. Does do I the motivation. digging. I need money. Still probably wouldn't be enough if they knew what they were getting into with the whole getting eaten by uh, raptors and stuff. But yeah, that's the part not. you didn't mention. And yeah, uh, that's that. It's all sorted. And it's like, so... 
Jesus Christ, we're moving so fast. Like, we've already accomplished so much in terms of... We've established our main heroes, the main plot line, thrust for everything happening, what's going to be there, and setting up exactly how this is all going to go already. Plenty of clues. It's like, so what's next? It's like, well, kind of the villain setup scene, which is also very quick. Uh. For uh, good old Mr. Nedry, Dennis Nedry, played by the wonderful Wayne Knight, who I know from this rat race. Uh, he was in Seinfeld as well, right? Don't forget his great yeah. turn as one of the people in Basic Instinct. Oh yeah, he is in that. He, he's 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 questioning Catherine Trammell. He says, "You ever tie him up?" His name he plays Mr. Corelli. He's like sweating in the. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Dodson, Dodson, so we good. got Dodson here. So uh, the, 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 we were talking to me and Rags when we were rewatching this about how memeable this film is and how it's. Uh, really evolved well into sort of modern culture. There's so many funny, there's like genuinely funny, and then it can be turned into so many different uh, applications for making really good jokes and stuff. It's, um, it's The meme factor for a film is a thing, and science will study it years from now, I'm sure. Yeah, um, this idea of this film came out so long ago, and yet so many of its scenes are not just iconic, but at least in terms of internet culture, they've been able to just persist through memes, which... I don't know. There's something. I don't. Maybe there's something there because it's not often that really. I mean, how often is it that really bad movies that people don't care about get memed a lot? Um, yeah, it happens, but uh, it happens. Like but, the Room was one know, of the biggest meme movies ever, right? Um, yeah. But, but I think all, the that... the interesting comparison we were thinking about is the meme factor for the prequels versus the sequels. Yes. Uh, prequels. The sequels don't get memed. No. Because no one like. Like everyone's su a lot of people are super defensive about them and no one likes them or so few people like them relatively. So, you know, I don't know. It's something to, I, I, I don't know. I don't, it, I don't know. The connection there's something is, there. there might be we'll something find there. out what it means in the future. Probably. All right. It's we're too probably we're in the era. The era has to be complete before we can look back or something. I'm not totally just making this up as I go, but Hey, the, uh, the, this is just setting up, and it's really quick. He works for Hammond. He's uh, he doesn't feel he's being paid enough. With what is done with such a really great line, right? Like he looks down at the bill being delivered, and he's like, "Don't cheap out on me now, Dodson. That was Hammond's mistake." Like, yep. Nice. Well, we know why done. he's here. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's so simple, so quick. That's his motivation. And they even show us like the technology he's got to steal the thing, and his role is going to be enough to get in. It's done in like a minute. And you even have Wayne Knight making an absolutely bizarre noise. Uh, to this day, I've, I, I, I remember jokes about how he sounds like a velociraptor. That squeal he does. <laughs> yeah, I just played it for the stream. There you go. It's, uh... I don't know. <laughs> it's, 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 it's such a weird noise, but they, uh... Just Wayne Knight being very, very happy and excited, which is, uh... Cool. I think the <laughs> angle here is that he's just like, oh, I'm like an I'm like a 007 type thing here. I look at my technology; it's all secret and cool, and it still works. Like all excited um, when he's going to be the biggest reason everything falls apart. Um, this film definitely has things to say about capitalism, but it's like a super unregulated and focused view on making money is obviously going to lead you to making ex extreme unethical mistakes. It's the reason why right. everything needs focus, understanding, wisdom, regulation. You need to understand what you're fucking doing before you do all of what they do, which uh, gives us results like they do. And yeah, uh, then we get Ian Malcolm introduced, and it's like, this is the last thing we got to do before we can basically start the film. They're all without their seatbelts for now, because it's safe, and then when they're going to be landing, he says it's going to be rocky, it always is, so everybody belt up, and uh, Alan's belt is not, he hasn't got the, the male and female sides of the connectors, everyone else does. And, uh, you know, uh, Hammond is like, you know, Alan, come on, by the time you put it on, we'll be landed. Like, uh, which I think is a good representation of the lack of safety sort of things that relate to the park and the fact that they're ill-prepared. Because they're all fussing over it, they don't seem to be able to figure it out, which, it's like, it's a belt, how could this be hard? Is it like a big mistake or whatever? But, um, there's a lot of that throughout the film. But it's also pretty clear when you start to think about it, what it represents. The old... He can't create a belt out of uh, female female, right? And then it's like, well, what if you tie them together instead of sinking them in? That'll work well enough for what I need. And it's like, oh man, yeah, you find a way, huh? When you're in, when you when you need something done, when something's got to happen. And um, start to think about later on in the film where uh, 
Dr. Wu explains that all the animals have been engineered to remain female. To, they, they deny them the uh, sort of development into male. And so you have no worries about any, um, any offspring. And then, of course, uh, Ian Malcolm says, well, uh, you know, he has a, we'll, we'll go over it, but he's got, he's got a pretty good speech in that scene about how this is an insane level of power you hope to control and you won't be able to, and that life finds a way. No, no, no. He says life uh, finds that, that, a way. That uh, is very important. I will. It's agree. so <laughs> weird. Life. Uh... Life uh, finds a way. <laughs> well, this is a weird. One of the first things he says, I think, is like, uh, "So you guys dig up bones." The, he sort of like agrees that he goes, "Ah ha 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 ha." <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> It's so funny because, yeah, um, uh, obviously Sam Neill is playing an absolute very normal straight man type character in Alan. And uh, he, like, you can tell he's got a lot of just issues with uh, Ian as the sort of first half of the film is going. Finds him frustrating because they're such mm -hmm. different people. Um, yeah, which leads to some landing, which I went over. And uh, the car ride begins and we get a reestablishment from the lawyer that, hey... If this place doesn't pass, then, uh, you know, we're going to be shutting you down, which I think is the most interesting, right? I think Hammond points this out. The one that seems to be most against him at the beginning is the lawyer, while everyone else is sort of, like, on board for the adventure. But by the time we actually get through the initial tours, the uh, old teams flip. The lawyer is 100% on board, and everyone else is like, uh, I don't know about this. Seems like you're holding on to too much more than you can necessarily bear. Which brings us to the Brachiosaur scene. One that um the famous brachiosaurus. Yes, yeah, the twenty minute mark, and they're they're now showing you, uh, showing off to you what you're going to be gaining from watching this film, right? And uh, what a what a good idea to start with a very huge, but still the more uh, you know I, I say harmless, but um, a herbivore. Which uh, there's something about the way that they approach doing the build up in this film of what dinosaurs they show at what scenes, uh, in what order, I guess, because. Um, there's so many things you... If we had a completely neutral state, what do you want to nail with dinosaurs? Like, well, we got to have the T-Rex. Like, yeah, 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 we'll have that. It's like raptors being the, like, super fast and scary and vicious uh, dinosaurs. Like, yeah, we want to have them. And it's like, what else? It's like, well, you're going to want to showcase the majesty of the life itself, right? It's not... You don't need them to be killers to be interesting. And that's one of the things I think that's just completely gone from any of the newer iterations of Jurassic franchise wasn't really about the fact that they kill you. That makes for really interesting sort of storytelling tension and stuff. But a part of this was supposed to be that dinosaurs are so incredible and amazing because they're, they're life uh, that did exist once upon a time and nature itself is enough to marvel at. And to capture that is honestly difficult. And I'm impressed that he managed to do it so well at Spielberg. But it's not in, you know too much of a surprise being that he's made so many incredible films as well. I think one of the things that's worth praising is the way that, like, uh, when it rears up and uh, Grant puts his arms out, there's a good direction in terms of what the actors are doing. Obviously, there's nothing there for them when they're acting it out. So good direction between what, um, like, they, they needs to be an understanding. This is what your character's doing. This is what you're reacting to. So it helps make the thing that's added in post and CGI more believable. Because if all the characters are acting very realistically and believably as to their environment, then it sells the environment in much the same way that how good it looks does. Um, when Thanos was made, you know, we had the big Thanos head that was up tall, which was, yeah. of course, very goofy at the time. But it's so that they knew where to look to Thanos' face. Um, and in a lot of other scenes that aren't directed well or in other, other productions... You have the special effects of either um, force perspective or stuff that's added in CGI, things of that nature. And the real people in the scene, they're not looking where they need to be looking. They're not looking at the eye level of the character that's being put into the movie. And so there's that big disconnect. It's like, why are you looking at like you're supposed to have this, the, the, this fairy or this something, whatever it is that's in CGI. But your eyes clearly are not following this character. There's... Some, something along the way, the communication was broken. I mean, it was... So that helps a lot in this scene. To I was going to say, it's it. lucky that uh, Robert got to talk about it, because uh, he'll be back. He's yeah. just... <laughs> but, like, he's going to be out for this one, but, but luckily already, he talked about it earlier. He already talked about a lot of it. It's, um... It's, this scene is iconic. Like, this. <laughs> there's no other way to describe it. Well, there's plenty of other ways to describe it, but it's iconic. 
I think the one thing this film can benefit from that it's very rare to benefit from is that uh, the insane thing that we're seeing, it was a thing. It's not made up. Like, uh, right, at least like, not the wholesale made up. There are... Yeah, dinosaurs existed. What they look like is kind of... Kind of hard to say sometimes. I think, like, our perspective on dinosaurs and what they look like has changed a lot uh, over recent years, it seems. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, yeah, you have a sense of what a dinosaur is and just getting to see one walk around. And it's the it's it's how they build up to the reveal, right? Of, I mean, not only in this scene, but, like, the 25, 30 minutes building up to this moment. But, like, just having it be focusing on the character's reactions to the dinosaur at first without seeing it. And then the big wide pan over to reveal the dinosaur. It's just the perfect way to do it. Well, and it's so it's cool because Samuel sells it perfectly that this is a man who's known about this stuff for so long and he he can't believe he's actually seeing it. seeing it. No way this is real. Yeah. Just like it's dinosaur, you know, like he can barely even utter the words. Yeah, and uh, you see, they are absolutely stunned and in awe from the fact that they're able to experience this at all. And then I love the fact that we have the direct comparison of right up to the lawyer, and he's like, we're going to make so much money. <laughs> like, the focus, the values, so uh, clearly in tow, it doesn't matter how overt something like that would be, because that is exactly what he would be thinking about, because it's just true. And you know what? It Highlights something so fucking annoying. There's a line in the newer ones where it's like, people got bored of dinosaurs, we had to genetically engineer new things, because, you know... Dinosaurs is just meh, eventually. It's like, fuck off. <laughs> like, zoos are still functional and beneficial. Uh, like, the the idea that dinosaurs, like, you've got a worldwide audience that have to come to you to see that. Something that you can't see anywhere else. The idea that people got bored of looking at dinosaurs, especially when there's so many dinosaurs you can even create and showcase. Yeah, I think the number of species that we're at now, that I think we know of, is it's in the thousands now, right? It's just... Um, prob I wouldn't be surprised, yeah, that there's an incredible amount of variety. And even if it's just, it's, I mean, the, I, the fact that Not they that have this attitude of. is a testament to the failure of their own creativity, and a failure to recognize what made dinosaurs so terrifying and awe-inspiring in the first Jurassic Park movie. Like, if you can't make dinosaurs work with people in a movie, then you're just a failure. I, I I think it was just a, an actual worry from the higher-ups that when they make their new Jurassic Park films, they need to go further than T-Rexes, because that's boring now. Like, a complete misunderstanding of how any of this works. And so they actually put it into the narrative for why it happened. Because like, people are bored of them. And it's like, I don't believe you, and I'll never believe you. <laughs> it's never going to happen. I can't imagine I'll ever get... I'm not even bored of seeing Jurassic Park multiple I'm not times. Bored of watching, exactly. Yeah, I'm not bored of seeing, you know, like, animatronic and CG dinosaurs. <laughs> imagine they were real, walking around. That would be... Uh, the idea, Yeah, just, it's just annoying. So Alan is like, you know, the natural question after seeing all that is like, how? How is this possible? And then you have this delivery from um, Attenborough that's like, I'll show you. Like... He's very, um, he's so genuine, I believe. He, he, I think any normal person would easily be like, well, I'm not going to show you anything about how it's created patents and uh, specific sort of, that's like seeing how the sausage is made. We're not going to let you do that. You can, you can see all the results well, of yeah, a controlled environment. Um, but he's genuinely invested in being like, look at what we've achieved. Look at this. Isn't this amazing? And, and, I mean, you see it again in the, the, the scene in the boardroom where, you know, the lawyer's like, dude, we got to chart, like people will pay like, they they will pay to a lot of money to go see this. And he's like, well, no, everybody in the world should have the right to see these animals. Yep. Like, his, even though he is misguided, there is a real earnestness and, um, and, and a good intent behind what he's doing compared to, yeah, just, like, the greed of the corporate side of just, well, this is going to make us so much fucking money. Um, it's, it's cool because the film presents, it, it, it presents, like, a gambit of different perspectives there's not just the fundamentally correct and incorrect perspective. There's like the dimensions to the correctness or incorrectness of the perspectives. He's a showman, yeah, not a even here when he, yeah. Yeah, even here he's like, you know, say hello. And he's, he's, he's got his lines and he's saying, oh, they're going to add the music in later. And it'll be really nice and everything. You know, he really enjoys the spectacle and making people, yeah. you know, enjoy things. And he's pretty consistent throughout uh, about that until the end when he's like, yeah, maybe I... Uh, yeah, you know what? Maybe this yeah, one great. Maybe what's the best idea? Well, like even him interacting with his video self is just something he clearly put thought into. Yeah. Was excited to show people. Like that alone is just like, yeah, he he loves entertaining people. 
And uh, it's just a really good idea to have as the creator of the park being that was his motivation instead of just a money man, so to speak. But I'm also glad that they I'll have the money them. man in it. I say I hate the DNA mascot. They should have gone with a different design. It's Gamut Fringy. Oh, you like that, huh? I bet that really blows your mind. <laughs> well, well, now I know. <laughs> um, so uh, before I give my POV on it, what's uh, what's the beef with the DNA man? I just don't like the way he's looking. I for, first off, you'll notice that in some of these, depending on the background that the DNA character is in front of, his mouth and features can be extremely hard to distinguish because he doesn't have like a body to him that can separate him from the background. Um, I don't. Uh, I just. I just don't like the don't like the design here of all the little circles and stuff. I just never. So the like reason it. I like oh, him I... so much is because yeah. I I take this whole scene to be such a representative of the problem. It's such a goofy and fun like um Oh, Mr. I, DNA, I mean, that's where you come uh, well, to be fair, I mean, I'm talking about his design as well. Okay. So he's he's like uh everything he delivers is also fun and peppy. He's a series of circles that are all different colors. He's kind of like a clown, like of a cartoon. And 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 we're treating this all like it's a big uh, festival showcase fair fun thing when what he's describing is literally the power of a god like what they've done is insane they can create life at will and uh, they can uh, take it from like all of history uh, which is what I, I think they could have done that with uh, another design but mine is just one in terms of like artistically the uh, kind of the way that it kind of blends into the background in some of the scenes where I don't think that was intentional because the mouth doesn't have like a he doesn't have like a head, so depending on you know like the background, the the mouth just sort of disappears. Uh, that's just all. I I would just change it up to something different. Well, it's going to be a rushed project, so you could definitely see it as having in world uh, reasons for why it's not as uh, efficient as possible. Maybe, you maybe. were just highlighting how he uh, he wants to reassure them it's going to look better and be well, it's going to be better by the end. Okay. Oh, you sound sound like you're aggressively agreeing. <laughs> No, 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 I, I get it. That, that's a, that is a reasonable thing, because it is not finished. They don't even have the final music and everything. And maybe this is DNA Man, you know, 1.0. Maybe in future they'll be like, oh, let's uh, change the design a little bit and, you know, work on things. Because, yeah, uh, you know, it's impressive, but uh, you, you obviously have Malcolm just getting further and further interested in staring at this thing. Like, Yeah, he leans forward and looking. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I like it because it is, um, you know, the whole time he's been sort of a goofster, like he's a very chill, so, you know, he's like a very chill guy. But then as he's starting to be fed, I mean, you mentioned it before, Mola, like he comes across as the, he is the first and the harshest in terms of his uh, flat rejection of the notion of Jurassic Park. Yeah, it's I... like it begins here when the science actually begins and he begins to understand like, wait, this is how it's actually sort of happening. Yeah, which is almost disturbing when you can think about many of its applications, which is the same for all technological advancements. That's like a warning you always have. It's, I think Crichton has written several stories that regard that specifically. So yeah, uh, they say like the geneticists will take over where the DNA strands are incomplete uh, from what they draw out of mosquitoes that are fossilized within amber, and then they fill in with uh, frog DNA. Which to me, yep. I have no idea how viable that would be in science, but to me, it it stretches over into this is our sci-fi take. Like, uh, I'll believe it. I'll, it's not yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy into it. You could buy, buy it. it. You know. Um, well, it, 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 would this film be considered sci-fi? Uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely science fiction. We can't make dinosaurs. Uh, it's just, it, 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 yeah, technically yes. I don't know if people. I was going to say, think I think. I was going to say on paper, I think yes, but a lot of people associate, I think, Jurassic Park with more action adventure almost. Um, well, I mean, I'd say that science fiction action and adventure aren't, like, incompatible. They're almost, like, different ones, right? Like, if you were thinking about what, uh, d types of genres exist in film, it's like, you can have, you know, like, an action adventure that's a fantasy or science fiction. Um, yeah. I think that, um, someone said it's too soft, I'm guessing, when they're talking about, like, the elements of science in it. Um, but I'm not sure if that would be, because it's, like, soft and hard science fiction genres uh mm -hmm. i'm not I, I have no idea where this would sit well, uh, we can't make wanna... dinosaurs yet well yet is kind of the relevant part about science fiction compared to fantasy is there is a level of you're trying to present it as plausible s to some degree rather than outright magic um 
even if the technology might be infeasible or we later discover that it's impossible or something you know like um and so i imagine jurassic park would jurassic park would surely be science fiction yeah it is yeah i figured that that wasn't even up for debate and and i guess it's um and and it's partially just stems from i guess as well the the desire to 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 some extent provide explanations for uh for, for you know for how it works is what the whole scene with them in the laboratory is is or, or this whole sequence in general is okay let's you know we've presented the information of dinosaurs are here let's make some effort to explain how it all works um and it's all relevant too right because it's all like reinforcing and building up um the uh what we what we see later the main example of that would be the nature of the breeding of like yeah no we all of them are female. Uh, we we have the eggs here. Like we want to control this environment. We want to um, we're going to control the population on this island. Only to later find out that th they have been breeding on the island itself. That like all of the, the efforts that they've made to try and control them have just not. It's just not working. Like it's not working as intended. That's kind of like that vibe throughout the the whole scene um, of of just a watching what they've done with a level of awe but just a sort of question mark above it all like hmm hmm not too sure about that they're in the lab and they watch the new dinosaurs you know hatching from the eggs and all of the scientists like can't help but you know be like in awe of this like they love it and particularly like um it's it's just uh it's just so fascinating right it's like the scientific interest uh like pulls them into it but then you know it contrasts sharply with when they're in the boardroom and e even with for how cool it all is and how much they they really love witnessing it just the uh the need to push back but like this probably isn't a good idea it's kind of like interesting to present though like I, I guess it's more so that it comes after the velociraptors can't resist comparing uh so like this is like roller coaster showcasing in the form of a ride their god powers, which uh, is having obviously different reactions from different people. But uh, by the way, very happy they included all of this. They could not have. Uh, what um, the desire to make it seem more like a theme park? That and the uh, the information on how it all comes together. They could have just skipped it. It could have been like, yeah, we cracked it. They could have. Yeah, science we use science it. stuff, you know, yeah. the stuff. But it it just helps add to its believability. It's like, yeah, this all seems like you know. It it doesn't break the bounds of reason. I could buy into this concept, and um, so that means you know makes the fact that there's dinosaurs running around in this park like a believable thing. But like this to me as well, it feels so applicable to the whole because we're going to get to his speech soon about how what he says uh, Malcolm applies yeah. to our feelings about modern IP, so to speak. But this feels like Hammond is like it, it's it's unfair because Hammond's much more um, I would say ethical than Disney in terms of. Not necessarily ethical. His characteristics are much more noble, in terms of he wants what he wants is much more uh, desirable as a trait than just to make money, so to so to speak. Yeah, he yeah. wants the yeah. world to enjoy and experience dinosaurs as they were. Um, it's just sort of a failure to realize, yeah, that's the thing they were and they're not anymore. But yeah, uh, that we get a scene that's just another one that's iconic and it ends up being shown and referenced. It's actually in the thumbnail: the birth of a Velociraptor. Mm. And uh, it, you can't help but compare Hammond in this moment to like what feels like God, in terms of like this is a creation that I have managed to produce almost fully, and here it is. And and what I love about it so much is his attitude. It's just filled with wonder and excitement. Yeah, um, it's so kind of adorable. And uh, that it, there's so many different tones to go through. Right, if you're designing this scene. You're like, you want to capture that, because that is very much in line with his character. Then by the time we hit the end of the scene, if you remember the shot, you have uh, Wu telling Grunt it's a velociraptor, and his fucking expression, like, you bred raptors? Like, what? Like are you insane, sort of thing? And then he just looks down, and he himself is holding in his hands a velociraptor alive. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, so great. Well, it's, it's uh, the the contrast of, you know, at first the awe, right, for these animals, but then even for as much as, you know, the, the scientists, like, really are just enamored with them, 
it's just you know every now and then it's just oh but wait like you shouldn't be doing this <laughs> like that just keeps coming back you know hammond then wants them to like go have lunch and talk about the wonders of the park but uh alan's like yeah. pushing to see the feeding and to find out as much as he can about these and then Muldoon turning up and saying, like, they should be destroyed, <laughs> they're lethal at age, blah, blah, And, uh, uh, you know, Hammond's like, ah, he's a, he's a bit of an alarmist, you know? So, yeah, it's just he's a, that kind of guy. He's a, don't worry about it. Like, there's nothing to panic about. And um, I just like the the, the feeding uh, sort of straps and stuff. They get it's torn to rustling. shreds. Yeah, the rustling leaves, and you're just left oh, on good. all of the it's... characters' reactions to it, but you don't get to see it because you don't need to see it. It's, it's scarier that you don't, and that, you yeah. see the effect it has. On the environment and the people watching, and then yeah, it lifts up and it's covered in blood and destroyed. Which uh, is a double whammy, right? In terms of just look at the ferocious power, but simultaneously, they're not prepared properly. That is obviously not the best way to feed them if it's going to result in your technology getting destroyed every time. So yeah, this is still clearly a new process for them. It's a, a level of um, I don't know if I'd say inefficiency, but uh, it, it ain't. This is ain't Mark there, One yeah. feeding delivery system. <laughs> it could well, be Mark yeah, Three at this point. Um, this is not working out. It's just, uh, and it's it's something that gets mentioned, you know, later on when they they're at the uh, Tyrannosaurus um, enclosure, and then they just put the goat there. It's like T Rex doesn't want to just be like fed a goat like on a on a slab, right? Like the animals have behavior, and the way that they treat and take care of these animals clashes very heavily with their behavior because they don't really understand their behavior. They're like yeah. animals that humans have never interacted with before. It's like the notion that you could meaningfully affect control over these animals when you barely even understand how they behave, you know? It's like bound for disaster, really. Yeah, and because uh, like we already have that problem with animals today. They're not taken care of well in a lot of like the worst zoos. Yeah. Um, so imagine yeah. doing it with something as the, the power the in dinosaurs. dinosaurs. Yeah, exactly. Who, uh, I do love this scene with them talking to each other in the boardroom. It's so great. It's really efficient. Everyone is yes. within character, and they raise some really great and very uh, deep thought points about how everything's going. I just like the uh, the inversion, right? The lawyer guy, when he comes, is like, you know, the investors, they're worried. Like, if one thing's wrong, they're going to pull your funding. And then as soon as he sees all the dinosaurs, it's like, so this is awesome. We're going to be merchandising this. We're going to charge like $10,000 yeah, per ticket. He's seeing dollar and bills. It's, it's flipped, right? The enthusiasm of uh, all of the scientists. It's now, you know, it's it's very muted, and it's all just focused on hmm, you probably shouldn't be doing this. And the fact that, yeah, Malcolm is the one who was, like, the most fervent in saying you shouldn't be doing this when originally he had the most, like, lackadaisical sort of chill attitude about, you know, coming here. Um, yeah, it's, it's just it, interesting, it, right? There's it's a reason dynamic of, uh, why he's yeah. the... Because they treat him as the... He's the trendy one they're bringing in to get, like, approval because he's probably good yeah. in his field. But this is us seeing that he's good in his field. He is good in his field because he, and he said it, you know, in the scene with the, uh, the, the velociraptors hatching, you know, the, the life finds a way, like you, the illusion of control that you think that you have here is, is, uh, it's ridiculous. And, and I think he says like the lack of respect essentially for like the powers that you're playing with here are staggering. Like it's, it's actually offensive to him how little regard they're showing for what they're doing, um. And then, of course, it culminates in, in that classic line, you were so concerned with whether or not you could that you didn't stop to think whether or not you should. Classic. I love that line. It's so good. Well, it's funny. Another classic. Um, you know? I really enjoy the line, but his his, his speech, is, uh, which I repurposed for talking about the state of the MCU <laughs> in, I think it was the Black Widow video. Um, so he says... Like, don't you see the danger? Genetic power is the most awesome power this world has ever seen, and you wield it like a kid with his dad's gun, which is something mm -hmm. a lot of people will reference with anything going forward. It's just a really great way to explain what you're doing. Like, because children are oftentimes they're not ill-intended with the gun necessarily, but they just run around because guns are cool toys, and it's like, that now is I'm not the of, uh... respect you need. He goes on to say the this power didn't require any discipline to attain it. You read what others yeah, have done, you took line. the next yeah. step, you didn't Oof, earn the knowledge yeah. yourselves. On that the hits hard. Giants. It does hit hard, especially when line. you repackage it for uh for media, <laughs> for Jurassic Park, or Jurassic Park the IP. Well. Yeah, you didn't yeah. you didn't have the discipline to acquire this IP. You didn't do all the work to get it to where it is. You don't even understand it. Well, is that not just a great representation of Jurassic World as a whole, <laughs> like a whole series? 
Yeah, you, well, so dude, crazy, what he says, you stood all the soldiers of geniuses being Spielberg and yeah. all of the army of amazing people that made this film. And then to accomplish yeah. something as fast as you could, they rolled out Jurassic World as soon as they would realize they had that and potential. Then, and before you knew yeah. what you had, you patented it, packaged it, and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it, selling it, selling I mean, it, selling yeah, it. yeah, merchandising and all of the, the attempts, box office gross of Jurassic Park, Jurassic World as a franchise. Man, and you could just apply it to so many things. You could apply it to all of the franchises that have been run into the fucking dirt. Yeah, like, obviously the people last, saying Star you know, Wars. Star Wars is a fantastic Wars, example. Terminator, Alien. Predator. Yeah, all of these classics, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. <laughs> Science why fiction, why do adventure. you think... Why do you think it is that these franchises... Obviously, I understand keeping an IP going. But why do you think IPs are... I, I would dare say that perhaps the Mad Max franchise, because the creator of that franchise has stuck with it. George, George Miller, Miller has yeah. been involved with all of them. But why why is it that the incentive to make, to, to make IP, to continue a franchise, is to make money? And yet, they're not as good as the original, and, and it's a law of diminishing returns. And all we do is see these great franchises that you would think are no-brainers brainer, to continue. Why, why are they not? Why are they not done well? What, what is, like, Jurassic Park is not exactly um, the most difficult franchise in the world to understand. And yet, when it goes on, we don't get greatness in them whereas if you look at a franchise like the mad max franchise i mean some people when when uh beyond thunderdome came out in 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 85 people were disappointed by it and i understand it, it wasn't the road warrior because that was amazing uh, mad max 2 was amazing however it was if you look at it as far as it goes and you get to fury road still respected but the jurassic um, park franchise even after the first film is the law of diminishing returns. So I think they just don't really know uh, what it is that was great about the thing that they're copying. Um, it's uh, it's like when you're looking at a great piece of art and you don't, it, it, you just sort of see what it is. It's like, oh, it's a bunch of people on a ceiling and all these guys in robes, and oh, look at that guy. Da, 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 da. But you don't really understand, you know, underneath what the stories are about, or the effort that went into it, or the thought process behind making it. They're not copying a thing's it, quote unquote soul in a way. They're just the thing as it in its most superficial sense. Uh, they're trying to copy I, uh, what people think they're of. They're not copying the process that made it, they're copying like the results. Yeah. Which is almost, there's no they're substance. Skipping to in the it. finish line yeah. in a sense. So, yeah, the scene, uh, it, I like some of the Ellie mentions here is that they've got plants for the way that they look around different parts of this um, area, but that uh, one or several of them are poisonous, um, presumably if you eat them. And it's like, uh, it, it's another representation of how the approach to the show of it is not uh, considered enough at all to in, in encompass safety. And um, you get Malcolm, you get her, you get uh, even the lawyer not providing the kind of support that Hammond is necessarily looking for, right? Because he's like, we're going to charge so much. And he's like, okay, fine, you know, Alan, you're the one that can uh, help me out here, right? You're the one that can see the value, you you understand, you know what's going on. But, uh, oh, I just love the libraries, like, dinosaurs and man were separated by 64 million years of evolution. They've just been thrown together. We have no idea what's going to happen. It's just like... Only it's a foreboding. really reasonable thing to say, you know. Yeah, that happens it's like for fuck's sake. <laughs> like yeah, talk about like, the nice cool bone things. here. Yeah, you're an archaeologist or you're a paleontologist. Throw me a bone here. Yeah, not bad. He didn't say that, unfortunately, though. He didn't, but would've he could have. Excellent line. He could. It was on the director's yeah. cut commentary track. Yeah, they wanted to, but you know, <laughs> legal yeah, reasons. Yeah. Um, the kids arrive and Hammond says, now let's spend a little bit of time with our target audience. It's like, yeah, because it makes sense that he wants to entertain everybody, but I imagine there's a lot of fundamental enjoyment in bringing awe to children's eyes. Uh, shouldn't be the... Kids, I remember being one and loving dinosaurs, man. But it's funny because yeah. like, just all ages, though, dinosaurs are amazing. It dinosaurs is kind of like, cool. we touched on it earlier, but it's like, why? It's like, I don't know. 
They like they just are. They're huge. big lizards with big teeth and claws, and they lived in a savage world, you know, the, where everything was wilderness far before civilization was even a a, a, a thought. You know, they have really cool it was names. It's a different too. world with different beasts. It's wild. Yeah, cool is dinosaur names and cool a cool categories. name because we think dinosaurs are cool, or was it a cool name always? Dinosaur? It sounds pretty unique. I don't think it's, it's, um, it's not like edgy the edgy or anything. It's like how we talk about why does Sauron just sound like a villain name? It's like, I don't know, it just does and it sounds well, awesome. <laughs> that's what it is, yeah. Uh, so, dinosaur is from uh, uh, the Greek and then the modern Latin. It means terrible lizard. <laughs> wow. Dinos, <laughs> Dinos and Soros. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. All you Grecians can uh, let me know. But yeah, terrible lizard. Neat. Um, but yeah, you have uh, plenty of moments for Alan having trouble with the the kid oh. who's really interested in his work because he's so experienced. Like the fact that he's read his book and he's just like, okay, fine, leave me alone. Uh, and yeah, it's just funny that he's like, which car are you going into? Ushers him into another one and then just closes the door on him. It's like desperately trying to get away from kids. And you even have uh, Ellie sending the girl to, to hang out with him. Because they all just want to have fun. But he's actually a little bit more concerned with the existential crisis of being able to create life at will, especially in the regard to these horrifying monsters, you know? There's a little bit more going on for him. But still, you know, it's just something of a beat they keep uh, pushing forward in the film. Um, And then I think they introduce, yeah, we've got the storm coming. Which, uh... On a fundamental level, for writing, um, some people highlight, like, aren't there a lot of coincidences? The fact that the storm is happening at the same time that Dennis is doing what he's doing at the same time that the tour's happening. I thought the tour was why Dennis had organized it to be now, because everyone's very distracted with their first ever visitors. It seems to make the most sense to me, and it also pushes it to the point where um, the park is getting ready for earlier launching. Which means they've probably got all of their genetic stuff in the bag, which means it's stealable for Dennis. So that timing makes sense to me. But the storm is like, yeah, that's 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 uh, incredibly inconvenient. But um, once you've uh, gotten past that, it obviously allows for a lot of extra things to happen. Um, the yeah, it's not unreasonable, and and the storm does slowly arrive. Um, there are scenes where it's starting to rain just a little bit, and then the storm, you know, starts coming in. You know, we'd have to see how common storms are in that part of, if we were really going to analyze it, you know, how common are storms in that part of the world? And, you know, it's not like they're in a desert, so it's not terrible. Yeah, and like you said, they do actually know it's coming and they prepare for it. Um, it's going to be alongside the sabotage from Dennis. It's going to be a big way to facilitate a lot of different payoffs. So that pushes you into the portion where things are going to start to fall apart. Significant. Uh-oh. Because you got, I quite like um, Hammond's on the little headset trying to show off everything about what they've got. They've paid like a, a special dude to get the voiceover in the cars. And see, that's like showcasing the park element of it. And they're all excited to see this thing it's being described. And they don't. It's like, oh. And I, to me, that's always been an in indication that it's like, yeah, see, it's still stuff that would appeal to us no matter what philosophy we can come up with for why this is horrifying. You just mm. want to see the dinosaur doing dinosaur things. And what's cool as well is the one they're describing is the Dilophosaurus, I think. The one that yep. uh, they're like, oh, it'll spit you know, venom or whatever at, at people, paralyze them, blind them, and then eat them without difficulty. Once again, foreshadowing for what's going to happen to an unfortunate person in this film. That guy is eaten. That is um irony. He would have been several meals for That's a true. Dilophosaurus. Maybe, maybe, I don't know how, far, how much they need to eat, you know? I'm not familiar enough with Dilophosaurus diets. My bad, I know. Um, but yeah, they conclude the storm is going to be super dangerous in, in uh, conjunction with everything else that's going to be happening. So it's like a warning to keep an eye on it. And at the same time, you have uh, their computer systems are not fully operational. So another downfall of this whole system is that they're relying a lot on automation. And uh, as as few people as possible, I think, which is the the more explicit evidence that as much as Hammond keeps saying we spared no expense is like he's always looking to spend whatever the amount is necessary to get the thing done but no more he doesn't want to like go further than that and so from his point of view paying Dennis and the few other workers that are even here hopefully they can because I think Dennis even has a line that says like you can run everything in the park with like three people 
because of how automated everything is. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that all falls apart with like one click of a button and storms fucking with everything. And that reliance on technology allows the door to swing right open for nature to take its uh, response. And all of that's being argued over. Dennis not being paid enough. Hammond trying to uh, sort of justify it. And you even have Hammond with a line that I think we're supposed to think a lot about as the film goes over, but he says, I don't blame people for their mistakes, but I do ask that they pay for them. Uh-oh. Um, Paying for mistakes. Oh my goodness. So, yeah, I can't help but imagine that's going to be on his mind in the last moments that we see him in the film. Um, and yeah, uh, they, they, they bickering gets, like, cut off by Muldoon, like, warning them they're approaching the, uh, the Tyrannosaur paddock. It's uh, it's it's done with such a like he's so he's so concerned to the point where you you wonder if he actually thinks any of this is is remotely safe. I think it's a matter of it should be, and <laughs> all things point toward it being, but you don't quite know exactly what's going to happen, and that's that chaos element they keep talking about. Um, Morley uses that line to fire people. It was a not it's just not a bad line in general. Is, um, you know, it's trying to acknowledge that you don't want to hold people in some kind of perpetual prison for their mistakes, but you want uh, something to be rectified as a result. There's a well, it, it goes into a lot of lines here. There's a there's a deliberateness to the script. Everything that the characters say is it, it's all about making you know setups. It's all about this will mean this later on, and this will be paid off in this way. This was not this is not what we call an accidental script. No. Lots of purpose. I think by here, uh, the more you pay attention to this movie, the better it gets, and the more foreshadowing shadowing there is on the themes and their execution. Well, yeah, because on a surface level, it's it's a fun dinosaur movie, um, and even though it's but even though it's not incredibly complicated in terms of what it's trying to achieve, it's like there's a lot of details there. The the line from Malcolm soon, where he's like, "God creates dinosaurs." God destroys yeah. dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs. Uh, which is fascinating enough to himself. And then she says, uh, dinosaurs eat man. Woman inherits the earth. And it's cool because you get him being like curious about what she's just said. And Alan's Both in the background. Both of them look over, yeah. He's just smiling. <laughs> like, she has a couple of digs like that in the movie throughout. Uh, more characteristics going on, you know? Oh, and this is where, yeah, you get the line from, I think, Alan saying uh, T-Rex doesn't want to be fed, he wants to hunt. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. It's, uh, Just the behavior is not being recognized by the um, the park. Yeah, which makes me wonder as well, combined with what Muldoon knew about the raptors in a sort of insufficient way, he's, uh, he's delivered as someone who knows the most about raptors. I think that's what Hammond says. But I do wonder how much he really would know compared to someone like Alan Grant, who studying them in depth extensively and historically as opposed to a hunter who's studying just their behaviors uh you know in a very controlled probably, very controlled environment there's probably a lot that they both know um how much of it's overlapping i'm not sure well but, yeah together you know, there, there's make... like the theoretical knowledge and then the actual like this is what they actually do the or well, comparing it to what actual real creatures do park. You know, no yeah, that's the problem wild. is Muldoon's information is going to be so limited because you don't get to see them operate in any kind of, like, you. how can you know anything like about how it will work yeah. to fight against them in an open environment when that's something you could yeah. never see? Um, oh yeah, and I think this is where we get an explanation from uh, Malcolm of what he means about like being a chaos titian, I think is how it's described, right? Well, yeah, and he, uh, the way he tries to explain it to Ellie is like, you would assume, based on information you had, what is going to happen next, but it doesn't. And then he explains, like, it's because of um, imperfections in the skin or the way that hairs move the dilation or distending of vessels. It's like, there's reason behind it, but it's so chaotic in terms of information that you can't have known ahead of time that you'll get results you'll never be able to predict. Um, That's a really good layman's... Um interpretation isn't it yeah because it's super super straightforward and then uh, yeah. i like that uh, you got to be like hey are there any dinosaurs on this dinosaur tour and you just have Hammond staring <laughs> at the screen uh, so just yeah. on that the wide so angle good. Lens as well look at his face <laughs> it's just funny he's like a troll at it, breathing on it yeah he's a fun character bringing in so some fun. of the biggest criticisms while simultaneously being a bit of a like jokester type that's just here for the mm -hmm. ride as well 
Because he does come across that way. He's uh, all about them ethics, but at the same time, he'll go wherever life takes him. Like, he is the chaos element. He has embraced own, chaos. In view. Um, well, yeah, that he's like, nobody could have predicted Alan would jump out of the car, and then Ellie, and that he's like, or oh, that I'd be sitting here talking to myself. Like, yeah, this, uh, <laughs> don't expect all this shit It's an to amusing movie. It, it, there's, there's plenty of little uh, jokes that can land really well throughout this, yeah. You try and nail it all, but you have a focus, you know? It has it no helps. velociraptor saying Alan. No, that, yeah, well, you know what, that was a dream sequence, so it's okay. Oh, okay. Okay. No judging. Enough. Yeah. No judging here. No judgment. If it's a dream, it's uh, yeah, it's good. We're all good. Oh yeah. The reason they're Ending able to get out and even check out the uh, Triceratops is because they don't have as th this. All these systems aren't complete. There's no locking systems on these cars yet. They're all they've been built for magnetism to the rails, and that I assume as well is going to be an awkwardness to how the locks would be controlled. Can it be controlled from inside, or is it only from the uh the security like? control room and if that would be even how viable is that idea. how in terms of you got to be careful in case the system shut down for whatever reason but in any case Muldoon says like we were supposed to get the locks sorted out and it's like haven't like, there you go people are just coming off the tour at will and um yeah we get the uh the triceratops scene which again to me, comes across as another attempt at trying to get the awe and incredible nature of dinosaurs before they give us the stuff a lot of people will be waiting for, which is the more aggressive dinosaurs, right? And the, the fear of them chasing you and stuff. It's like, there's a lot more to appreciate about them than just big spooky lizard. The Triceratops animatronic is so great. It's kind of so incredible, great. yeah. Yeah, because um, it moves with... Um... I don't know. I, and I think that's it. Goes into the like both the animatronics and the CGI. They they're they're believable not just because they look pretty good, but are really good in some instances. But they move well. The breathing, you know, it's it's this it's the breathing that that sells that that uh, animatronic. Gives it life. Yeah, and and that's hard to do. You know, of of uh, yeah, no uh, that eye as well. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the it's so well done, and all that you know. There's guys and girls and people making these things work. They're in the background, you know, doing all of that, and it's really beautifully done. I mean, Stan Winston, you know, before he rest in peace, Stan. Uh, before he passed away, he put together the very best of physical effects, makeup effects people in Hollywood, and Jurassic Park is a great example of what they were able to do. It reminds me of um, how when the prequels came out, there was a unified complaint that there was too much reliance on CG, not enough of the practical that the OG films had. And then I remember the promotion of Force Awakens. They were like, look at all this practical stuff. I remember them. they, they had like the one of the aliens on stage in its like yeah, full like, outfit. Being like, see, look, look at this. Like, it's amazing. And it's funny because you skip forward to the end of that trilogy and it's just a mess of CG. Like, um, it, it was it was even the respect to the idea of having practical effects was superficial. It was like, we have this because people like it, right? Like, it, it's never from the ground up for why you have these things or how they're built or what they do. It's just, oh, it's a, it's a good film, so it has to have special effects, I guess, that are physical or practical. And you're sitting there like, well, it's, it's more than that, man. Like, you don't, it's not, because uh, I have to push back on this every once in a while. There's a lot of CG hate that's happening. Um, it even comes from me as well, and I always want to try and Sometimes, refocus yeah. to be like, well, it's not, CG is amazing. Um, and this is a film that has it in, in spades as examples of when to use it properly. I'm looking forward to when yeah, we get to some it, of the it's shots. It's all about how things are employed. Yeah. I mean, it yeah, always comes down to the Blame use the of things. Uh, there, there's, there's several Rock shots I want to good example of that, yeah. sort of like uh, go into a little bit deeper in terms of like slowing it down and stuff, because it's kind of amazing in this film how. It's using CG better than like all of Phase Four. Um. Mm. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Because I mean, Ant Man and the Wasp. It's not even a matter of it's going to age poorly. It just looks bad now. I think that's one of the things that I've started to as more more tech as more time passes between these films and the technology gets better. It's like the I I think why is it that some things age better than others? And it's like, it's got to be the way that the technology is employed because you can have, you know, two things come out at the same time. You look at it with a lot of video games, right? There are certain video games that age way better. And a lot mm -hmm. of it can be attributed to art styles. Like, you know, Wind Waker is the go-to example. That game won't age basically at all. Um, 
but but even games that kind of go for like a little bit more of a realistic look it's like through really great art direction in those cases and here it seems like it's just it is how you use the tools not like how old it is or even how much it is it's just how you use it completely agree but yeah uh dennis is about to enact his plan he's got a limited amount of time to get to the boat because the storm is going to speed up it's uh leaving the island because it's getting dangerous um and so he needs to do this now and so he sinks it and uh starts grabbing the stuff but of course the the fact is he's going to try and lower all the security so that he can not only get out but it can cause chaos for these guys that are too busy to deal with him i'd imagine that was all the goals i don't think he's ever explicit about exactly why he's doing all of those things you even have um samuel jackson's character saying like why did he lower the fences and the interesting thing to note is that he didn't lower the fences for the raptors um, which is commented on, I think, is it Muldoon later says, like, not even Dennis would have done that, because that's a... Yeah, when they were going to the power uh, station, yeah, he tells it to Ellie. As much as it's he sabotage, it Ellie, yeah. that's how much, that's Dennis knows that releasing the Raptors is a seriously bad idea. Um, yeah, and he has this moment where he's like, I want to go to the vetting machine and pick up uh, some stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, do, 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 do you guys want, 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 want anything? And it's just like, man. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, can you look any more suspicious, dude? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I do like that it's, it's reasonable that he said it, but I just love like, where is Dennis? Someone check the vending machines. Like, I think that's what happened. Yeah. Says. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm check the vending machines, which is weird because I just don't think he'd fit in there, but. I guess you might as well gotta, look. Gotta look, right? You gotta look everywhere. Gotta look. You might be in there. Um, and yeah, you have one of the the few that I love back and forth between um, Malcolm and Alan, right? Like, how many kids? It's like, oh yeah, three. Anything that can happen will happen, or uh, it's the Murphy's Law thing, right? That's Murphy's Law, yeah. So, Which is any uh, anything that can happen will happen. Wait, what was what was they saying? Interstellar was that? They said they anything said? that can go wrong will. I think. Oh, um, Murphy's Law is no, anything it's... that can go wrong will go wrong, whereas what they said in Interstellar was the other one. Anything right, I got it backwards, before. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Interstellar fucks up what Murphy's Law is. Even though which is weird, yeah. considering one of the characters is one named, of the after, characters it and it's, named yeah. after it, and it's a big part of the film. <laughs> uh, well, oh, every, time, um, every time I go through that or uh, find out about it, I always have to end up Googling some stuff, because I always get mixed up on the laws as well. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you don't want to get mixed up in the script. That's, uh, <laughs> like you want to make sure about that. Oh, you fucking, it would be a bit awkward. Uh, maybe that's foreshadowing for eventual coverage of Interstellar or deep dive. But yes, uh, what Malcolm's referencing then is that a different law or is it a variation? <laughs> I'm genuinely asking. So I'm not actually sure. Which one? Sorry. Anything at all can uh, and does happen is what he says. I think. Uh... Anything can and uh, does happen. I don't know what that is, yeah. Might be a reference to something that ties, else. Then. Maybe it ties into chaos theory, this idea that, you know, it, every, anything could, you know, who could have known, who could have... Well, he's really definitely embracing it, it to the, the other thing, yeah. Like, the fact that he says, I'm always on the lookout for a future ex-Malcolm, being that he's he's just going to embrace the, uh, the journey of getting married, having kids, whether or not there's the expectation of things going wrong, because he's aware of how much... Everything can go wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. People say Murphy's Law, but again, Murphy's Law is anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So, like, there's got to be something else, right? Yeah, whatever they say in Interstellar is not Murphy's Law. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the things I, I remember. I don't remember the specifics, but it's one of those things that the movie does just so well. <laughs> Someone said, you don't know Murphy's Law? Apparently not. Uh, uh, until I go reading about it on the... Uh... On the wiki pages, because I thought it was one thing, but mixing up them laws, something I do. Plenty no, we were, we were right about Murphy's Law. Oh, well, I'm saying I do. I mix them up. Um, anyway, he's uh, you do be doing the stealing bit in this moment. You and said dooby doo. Uh, I do. I, uh, I, I look for you know on Mountain do Dew, you know, Mountain Dew bottles, they used to say dooby dooby doo on them. Why? Because they sell D E W is how they'd spell it dooby dooby doo. Yeah. 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 That yeah, was, he's uh, um he's yeah. stealing what looks to be like the core DNA for each of the dinosaurs. And I always remember thinking, like, man, I'm surprised they only wanted one of each. You'd think they'd want a whole like you know, 
fill a briefcase or something. It's, uh, those things will be incredibly valuable. We're talking like millions of dollars, I'd imagine. And yeah, um, yeah. Millions, that might be underselling it. It might be, yeah. Maybe a Barbasol can. It, it is more under the radar than a briefcase. You know, if if they're if they're doing checks for things, you you wouldn't think to check. You'd be like, okay, this is a can a of Barbasol. Pretty sure there was a line for that in the movie that it was specifically yeah. in the can because it would be easy to get through, like customs. Yeah. Oh I yeah. Well, in it. that case, just you'd think they design it so they can steal some more. I don't know. I just would have thought maybe several cans of. Well, maybe it's too suspicious to be carrying more than one can of Barbasol. <laughs> well, I think he says you got to get one of each, probably referring to the fact this is a one-time thing. Once you steal it, the 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 security is going to be insane, and it, and it won't be yeah. a, well, like it won't be easy or possible to, you know, have for, a second for, go yeah. around. So mm -hmm. you need to get the variety that's what's important because this is our only chance so i mentioned they're embryos i i'm not actually sure oh wait no yeah it does say embryo yeah, yeah. yeah these are embryos i thought maybe it was um the stages even before reaching an embryo but uh because of i don't know what stage of research you need to steal to get the guaranteed results but uh, yeah um supposedly that would be enough and i think that like we talk about the deliberateness of everything and a lot of the symbolism of the script and uh, I think that the can of Barbasol is there to represent how hairy the situation is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is all... Because this, this is where the tension really starts to rise up, because you uh, you know what you're in for with a movie like this, and there's just so many red flags everywhere. Uh, oh. All those fences going down, all the setup they've yeah. had about everything the dinosaurs do. Just like, oh, this is not going to end well. And then, of course, Dennis... Um, rushing so hard to get to the dock because of the rain and him fucking around and being so desperate he eventually uh, crashes and no longer knows exactly where he's supposed to be going and then because of uh, everything being shut down gates are opening and different things he accidentally crashes into I, I assume the Dilophosaurus paddock or um, a place that the Dilophosaurus has ended up in uh, Mr. Nedry which uh, actually I don't know do we see all of that before the... I think we get the T-Rex scene first. Mm. Which, um... I feel like the whole film has been very carefully building up toward. It's building up to a lot, a lot of things, but this is one of the bigger ones. And it feels like this is the the first one. Um, In a similar way, you could say about the, the Brachiosaur and the Triceratops, but this was the big one. It's like, we've got to nail this. This is what people are at the Cinema before, sort of thing. And, uh, and it will forever be referenced as a time where they absolutely bloody nailed com uh, combining CG and practical effects. Oh my god. I mean, uh, this movie is is a masterclass in doing that. You even have and that, that cup with the, the tremors. Oh, A visual so that good. everyone remembers. Well, it's, it, you know, the idea and, and in the theater, when you saw this when it came out, the base the 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 surround sound it came out and i don't know i don't want to say this is the very first dts film um but the 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 digital sound processing of this in theaters was amazing because when you saw that water and you heard the it was pretty incredible in the theater Thing. We've not been dealing with stuff this big before. So you get these no, like it's... fun ways of because this whole scene is just build up, build up, build up, build up. And oh um, yeah, everyone's gonna have lots of different favorite shots. But one of the ones I absolutely love in terms of uh, Rags brought this up when we were watching. But um, something that seems to be benefiting this so much is having these animatronics actually being in the rain. Uh, yeah, having real water running down them. Uh, does a lot of uh, help to sell these as being real. Um, everything's in rain. The cars are in rain. The people are in rain. The animatronics, they're, the puppets, they're in the rain too. So the rain, I mean, they're real. So it, it makes them seem like they're, you know, really there, like they're part of the world. Well, I have to say that that at the time, part of the reason that they're in the rain is because they needed that to sell the CG. Because it wasn't oh, quite yeah, the, there yet. It, it, that's the thing. It sells CG and it sells the practical stuff. Yeah, I mean, all the way into uh, 1998 when Roland Emmerich did Godzilla. God, ugh. <laughs> but, 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 oh, man, don't get me started. But that's the reason that the, the, the scenes in New York with the 
faux Godzilla rampaging were in the rain because rain was a great way to um, get rid of any, uh, uh, let's call it, less perfect effect shots. And it was an easy way to be able to transition between CGI, practical, and um, practical effects, and then just live action. The the way the effects were caressed into live action, it was so well thought out. This scene is uh this is a great example of basically like a hyperflex as a filmmaker. It's yeah. like a really amazing like in a microcosm, it's an awesome tech demo, but I mean obviously in the scene with these characters, it's so cool like having this incredible spectacle of the T Rex, the terror, the tension. Um and and like it's all feels so seamless. Like it's it's such an amazing sequence and it feels like it hasn't like if you saw this in a film release today it would just be as effective uh as it was you know back in 1993 when we talk about uh, there's so many different totally choices agree. for special effects you can use and today it would just everything would be done with cg for the dinosaurs in uh like the lost well the the world franchise I'm, i i don't know if they've ever i assume they still use some practical in some places in those movies but i can't say i know for sure uh, uh, i i legit don't know if they even do maybe they have practical stuff on set but it'll be like the green big foam thing or or like a tennis ball or, or something not it'll like be a this, base where we have... and then they'll put cg goo on top yeah. of it as opposed to what we have here which this 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 scene is like such a great example of jumping back and forth between practical and like cgi it's where you don't even notice because here like the shot with the dinosaur eating that uh that goat well, that's yeah, the, real the reason why i've got this up here is yeah. that i want to like, as much as it's definitely a time to appreciate the use of cg the blending of it the animatronics themselves the actual it's physical amazing. special effects yeah. are out of this fucking world good i've always remembered this moment especially because it's the the action of like swallowing the goat and then it like slowly realizing like what's going on over here sort of thing. This shit is just enough for me to realize like, oh my god, <laughs> is that thing actually there? Like, is that is that how it would look? And it's seriously, that sense of being there. Yeah, because it um, is there, of course, oh, when they were the filming lighting. it. And yeah, the lighting, the, the lighting. rain, the reflections from all of the look at that wet. shot. It's gorgeous. It's so good. Look at him there. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then the fact that it integrates so well of him actually moving. And it just seems like that intercutting of almost a recognition of how how much do we want to have it be like, you know, CG to where we need to try and like ground it again with uh, something that, you know, for absolute sure is real. And it's almost like the effect is that people don't even know which is real or not. And like when you don't know, you kind of buy into it totally. Like if you can't right. tell if it's real or not, it's like you're kind of already there. I'm pretty sure James Cameron's talked about that before. Like if you can get people... I think what he said is, like, if you can get somebody to be, like, invested in this face, like, honing in on their eyes or whatever, that that's, uh, that's, like, enough. And well, I mean, case, clearly he knows um, what he's talking about, eyes. considering that box office. Well, but... <laughs> all of these guys, all of these guys know how to use the tools. And I think we talked before about the intentional use of it. When, if you're making a film like this, where you've only got, I think someone in chat said about five minutes of visual effects work, it's like... There, there was no, there was no haphazard, we'll fix it in post kind of mentality possible here, because it needed to all be very deliberately constructed to make it feasible for them to, to do this. Um, like, they needed to know which shots that they were going to be making were visual effect shots and plan for it on set to make it, especially when you don't know if it's even possible. It's just that amount of precaution and care going into it. It, like, shows in every frame compared to ant-man where it's 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 much more broadly careless but not careless on the part of the individuals working on each of those shots right and, and to immediately after seeing that this incredible representation of the t-rex and then you have the lawyer just fucking sprinting yeah. off terrified well, yeah we're, we're still doing character right because this is the moment where we get to see these characters jumping into action he ran off Whereas uh, Grant and Malcolm are, are, are going to like jump in to, to yeah, because they don't even the situation. they don't even know why he's running because uh, he says when well, you gotta oh, go, you yeah. gotta go. <laughs> he thinks he's going to Thailand. <laughs> That's right. Which... That's right. They have and then that, which is really cool as well of lopsided information that can always be really great for drama when some characters know a whole bunch. Um, it's it's like, impossible not to fucking love though. Yeah. They yeah. say that, and then we pan left. They both turn, and you hear the <laughs> of each of the wires just coming down. Mm. And you're like, that's that's the feds. It's like what <laughs> you know, it, 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 something that you'd reasonably assume is impossible is just happening now. The T Rex is out right next to both of these cars. It's just out, and 
and what an amazing payoff uh, when we built up to it for an hour you know that we're finally yeah here. and uh, uh, not only does it, it it just it's it's a restraint it doesn't you look at this and you don't think oh restraint but you think about how we got here and it's like well they could have splooged this all over the camera way mm -hmm. before now and shown you everything and just been excessive with its display but this is like a payoff in and of itself, just seeing the thing for the first time. We talked about it with uh, House of the Dragon, the old man walking. This is dinosaur moving from its paddock to outside of it, and it's one of the most memorable things that happens in this whole movie. Uh, I say that as if the movie isn't filled with amazing parts constantly. I guess I should say it's one of the most memorable in the whole franchise. It's a T-Rex. You used to be able to impress us with just the T-Rex existing, okay? <laughs> that used to be something you could do. Not anymore. When the reality is that you still can, uh... Just a, as how you long use as it, you know, well, couched within the context of a story that has characters who you like is uh, is a big ol' that's a that's a good start. Well, like I just you know, how long before it's Jurassic Park in space and there's a dinosaur with lasers attached to a spaceship, <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, why if all not? Else I guess. Fails, if all else fails, space, and yeah, um, on the topic <laughs> of utilizing everything at your disposal, the it would be interesting to ask initial audiences how much they thought was CG if they were told the exact seconds mm. amount of dinosaurs on screen. Because, like, you have this, the big old animatronic practical big boy head at the at the top right of the car, and it's just like, yeah, there he is, looking creepy as fuck. Camera pushes in, and the CG one takes over. Such yeah. a good idea, such a creative idea. You see the very real practical effect, and that will, like, it'll, it's just going to have the natural effect of your brain believing that thing is that. And when you see the CG one, it can help blend it in your mind, I would say. Like, a, like mm. a, you see them together, almost. Yeah, kind of, well, it's the continuity is not broken, so there's no reason for you to assume that anything else has been broken, like the, you know, practical nature of the T-Rex. The rain, the darkness, yep. and then keep switching from those different shots. And... Man, what a, what an awesome animatronic that you put the light on it and then is is uh, the pupil changes die lights. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's such a cool detail. It just it just adds to helping you believe it. Yeah, absolutely. It was the little details, the little touches that breathe life into it. Like before talking about the Triceratops breathing, those little d d sort of yeah, th it's just the tiny details. Gorgeous. Oh, yeah, look at the, that. The and then it starts killing her with the light. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, uh, I guess it's one of them, a little bit of trivia for you moments, because I've heard it said a couple of times, where Rags, you were mentioning it uh, last night, the, he starts pushing in on the car from the ceiling, and then the glass itself comes through. And uh, were you saying, do you know it like as a, as a sort of established thing I've that heard... that was not deliberate necessarily? I've heard that it wasn't supposed to go through and push the glass oh. down from the top. Um, I've heard that that didn't, uh, that, that that just sort of happened. Um, I don't know if it's true, but that that's what I've heard. Um, so really? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd have to check. If anything, like, it's it, certainly. It's just awesome if true. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's one of those. Oh, this happened to have happened. Oh, good. The children are actually terrified. Excellent. That'll 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 be great for our movie. Yeah, it's because uh, improvisation utilizing accidents is another part of, uh, I was going to say filmmaking, but I mean the creative process in all. Once Alan and Malcolm realize what's happening, they both have pretty big moments of like, we're going to save these kids, we got to. Like, obviously the complete, in, co in comparison with the, the lawyer. Um, I, I almost say that as if it's to imply lawyers don't care about kids. Of course, no. It's just... Uh, that's, of course, that's... no, they don't. We all know that they don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, Alan nails it. He distracts it with the flare and tosses it. It starts heading toward it. That gives you the opportunity that Malcolm, looking to help, is like, yeah, I got the flare too. Hey, hey. And he's just like, no, 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 freeze. Like, what are you doing? Then he starts getting chased by it. And of course, Malcolm, just trying to save his own life, heads in a direction, gets hit over, covered in a bunch of uh, debris from the building falling apart, which reveals Lawyer Man to the T-Rex. <laughs> his efforts to yeah, hide from it basically guaranteed his death. And you know, this is another... Before we go, um, before we go too far, uh, uh, unless I blank, do we talk about, like, the mud in, underneath the car? Well, um, oh, I'm glad you brought that up, Rags, because um, something that I was reminded of while watching this film is, man, we've lost just, like, the grit and, uh, like, yes, like getting, people getting hurt, <laughs> people getting dirty, 
Like everything yeah. is true. Yeah. Everything's super safe and, and sterile. It's everyone, every sterile. everyone's. Don't worry, we'll CGI on. the mud on you. <laughs> everyone's nice hair oh is my always God. ready. Everybody's <laughs> got their lovely Hollywood faces, and this is like, because I think the mud serves a a number of uh, purposes. It does. What Fringy had mentioned it. It's like it's muddy, it's dirty, it's gritty. Um, you know, it, this is not a clean, sterile place. But the way that the car is flipped over and is spun around and the weight of the T-Rex pushing down on it into the mud, it's just another one of those elements of selling to you that the T-Rex is real. Because even mm -hmm. though it's not in, like, the shots here, you know that this thing is being pressed down by this essentially monster on oh top my God, of it, and the mud so is sinking right. in. <laughs> it's the effect. Because it's how it's the, the environment effect. reacts to these things yes. and how the people yeah. react to these things helps you believe it. And I think it's yep. in no small part, it's one of the biggest things that you could do to make sure everyone's reacting to it realistically. Also, the feeling yeah, of uh, your shuttlecraft in my shuttle bay, that. that's all I can say. The that's feeling of being wow. trapped, too. Uh, yeah. The absolute horror. You don't want to get out of the safety of the car. It's like, you got to get out of the safety of the car. The car is not safe for, <laughs> no. for very long. You know? No. The car is not, yeah, rated for T-Rex attacks. No. It is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, I mean, I can't help but look into that, right? One of the first things a T-Rex does is just fucking crush this car. A big representative of one of the coolest sort of uh, technological human achievements creations. of human creation. Well, yeah. it fucks up with, it, 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 it like pulls the muffler or whatever it is off the bottom it takes it rips a tire off it's like yeah an animal would i guess fuck around with this weird thing in front of it yes yeah, like is there so any part of you that's tasty it it's like nope 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 what <laughs> what's, this is what's this <laughs> like, thing it's almost like you're saying uh binding it into the world with physics around it as well as um the it's way so it looks important. So it's, yeah there's so it's much going so on so important especially because the because i they probably have a real foot um that they're showing pressing down on the car and, you know, when they move the... I, I don't know how they do it. I think they have something that flips and moves around the car. And so the car is real and its movements are real. And then they have the uh, CG dinosaur, you know, looking as if it's causing those motions on top of it. I might be why so it works. It's, it's that I'm blend of... Yeah, yeah. Um, whatever they're using, they, they blend it together really well. Well, um, yeah, what better way to make a CGI thing seem real than to have it uh, actually interacting with a real thing? Like, who mm. framed Roger Rabbit when you have huh. cartoon characters who are carrying around real objects and they go through the trouble of having cutouts in the floor and things hanging from the ceiling so that people make the movements of the real objects so that afterwards the animators can come in yeah. and animate creatures carrying these actual real objects. And it allows for a seamless transition of an, a an object being handed from a tune to a real person who can then take that real object and continue yeah. to interact with it. So true. Um, they don't do that shit anymore. Probably worth mentioning too, because so many aspects of why it's believable. The sounds the T-Rex makes. Um, oh, the sound. It's, what an iconic it, roar that the T-Rex has. Ruined the, it ruined the sounds of dinosaurs in the same way that Elijah Wood ruined the look of Frodo in a way. Like, can you imagine these things sounding any other way now? <laughs> yeah, you, and, and so it could be yeah. like, that's not how they would sound. It's like, don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care. That's how they sound dude, in my heart. that's how they sound, man. Come on. Come on, oh, dude. It's fucking brilliant. And I've heard, don't know if it's true, that it was a mix of crocodile and lion to make the uh, T-Rex roar. Um, really? uh, that's what uh, I remember reading it somewhere. Um, that's so, cool. Don't know. It, yeah, I can't say for sure. I should have probably checked, but um, I got some news here. Uh, the strange bark like sounds that the film's raptors use to communicate is actually the sound of tortoises having sex. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> that's uh, according to this article here. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Rids, this guy, who's Ridstrom? Uh, bu -bu this is the sound. The film's sound designer Gary Ridstrom spent months recording and fine-tuning the dinosaur noises. He said, "If he knew where the sounds in Jurassic Park came from, it'd be rated R." Um, <laughs> the barking Velociraptors are the sounds of tortoises mating. Uh, the Gallimimus stampede. Uh, the high-pitched squawking sounds those little guys make are terrifying. That's that they're actually the sound of a female horse. Squealing at a male horse when he got a little too close and she got excited. It's interesting, like with Jurassic Park, how when you like watch the film again and you just you just remember so many of the things that this film did that are just persistently referenced, both in ways that are obviously more overt nods to it and 
borrowing or uh, leveraging some of the things that, like the vibrating water, right? That's that's become a thing in so many movies at this point. Of like, if you focus in on water vibrating because of you know loud thuds and everything on the ground, mm -hmm. as it's fucking around with uh, Grant and the and the kid, it's, it pushes them off the side into that pit I was talking about. Which, like I said, logistically speaking, not sure if it's supposed to be there or not. Need to check. But, uh, you know, it makes I didn't it... even register that first time. Like, when I... Hmm. It's particularly this shot that makes you think, like, wait a minute. Like... Yeah. Huh. Like, how far does this pit go? And it's like, I don't see how the T-Rex got up. How did, how did this... Because even it's... from this angle, the fact that it levels out to the same level, like, a little bit further on, it's like, man, that's gonna be a steep sort of drop, isn't it? You wonder if there's, uh, like, a hill? Like, it, yeah, like a yeah. very steep hill, I guess. Yeah, a hill to the left someplace where it can, I don't know, it's it's a little bit confusing. Yeah, yeah like I said, I have to look into it, but... Yeah. Yeah, they start rappelling down on one of the broken wires, and uh, the kid is uh, still in the car, and he's gonna end up in the oh, tree. Because yeah. the T-Rex is just continuously pushing it, I guess, looking for a, a chance at his food. It's hyper-stressful, isn't it? Because it's so much that Grant just cannot account for. No. Like, all of this crazy stuff, and he's on his own having to deal with it, and how can he? It's a T-Rex. Well, that's the thing. Two of the adults are knocked out so quickly. Like, one's eaten, one's, uh, well, knocked out. Yeah. And, uh... And he's all on his lonesome. Yeah, at this point, it's a disaster, and, uh, you know, it's only gonna get worse. But something I quite like is, uh... Uh, Hammond being like, Robert, I wonder if perhaps you could take one of the gas jeeps and bring back my grandchildren. It's such a, like, strong and stern way of what is actually happening subtextually, which is, good God, please save my children. Yeah. Like, like my grandchildren. And and uh, Muldoon is just like, yeah. Because, yeah, 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 of he, course. He jumps right in. Yeah, of course I'm the one that's going to do that. that. That makes the most sense. Yeah, uh, none of these characters are just the asshole that we can see die later that I think a lot of other films would do. It's like, oh, this guy's just the jerk. We can have him get eaten and people will like Oh, by that. the way, how, how refreshing is it of a character saying, I'm going with you, and they're not like, no, you're staying here. And they're like, no, I'm uh, going. I can do this all no, on my I'm own. No, I'm doing that. It's just, it's just you, you accept, yeah, like, I am coming with you. It's like, yep, all right, let's go. She's probably like, yeah, please <laughs> come with me. I'm actually kind of fucking terrified. Um, it would be nice to have you come with me. It's downright refreshing to have that, which is funny considering that a lot of films afterward are doing that bullshit of like, no, you're staying here, all right? Well, that's, um, there was another line that prompted me to say something very similar. It was, uh, later on when the, it, it was in this room when, um, uh, Sam Neill and Laura Dern, I, f I forget, their character names escape me, uh, but they're Boy. at the door, the Velociraptor's trying to push in the door, and the shotgun has fallen down, and, uh, uh, Ellie... She says uh, frantically as they're trying to keep the door shut, I can't get, basically she says, I can't get the shotgun without leaving the door. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense that you'd yell that to him because he might not necessarily know that. And it's a frantic panicking situation. And you just want to make that really clear to him so that he understands what's happening in this frantic well, moment. Something that, because uh, it happens with the um, the car, which comes right, shortly it's a after rifle. No, wait, 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 wait. No, no, it is not a rifle. It's a Spaz-12 uh, Spaz shotgun. 12, yeah. It's a classic Italian model. Um, what I was going to say was uh, something that, like, you look at a lot of the really stressful situations that occur in the film, uh, especially parts where it's, like, real close. You know how in, films like to cut it real close in terms of uh, big dramatic moments, and often how frustrating it is when characters are saved by an inconvenience. This film has a lot of instances that are inconvenient for the characters in terms of timing of what's happening, and where situations get worse because of very understandable, honest mistakes. Like, um, like when, when, uh, with the car, when, uh, uh, Grant, like, accidentally, like, when he moves the steering wheel and then it redirects the tire to where yeah. it loosens its grip on the, uh, on the tree. It's like a yeah, nice, understandable well, it's they knew, that causes drama. Presumably they knew when filming it. It's like, it's gonna be annoying if we just have him take the kid out of the car and then for some reason the, the car it. falls yeah. when the, there's yeah. less weight. It's like, no, if we can find a way to make this, make something happen. And I, yeah, I appreciate the fact that he just instinctually grabs onto a thing that's there, which is the wheel. And then it turns and he's like, oh, fuck. And then those wheels turning fucks up its leverage on the, on the tree branches, which is good stuff. Yeah. Branch drama, and it's 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 not some bullshit. Like it's a really honest sort of error, um, as opposed to characters being stupid. 
because nobody in this film is is dumb, right? People are making the best decisions they can in difficult situations. I find to be a lot of understandable, right? Because we're about to talk about De Dennis's death scene. And, uh, uh, yeah. The one thing I said this while watching it, the one thing I never fully understood in this movie is the slip sound effect he has. It goes Wheat! like he, yeah, we noticed that. It's cartoony. It's so weird. Um. Of all the things, you know, you just like because there's there's not many of them I, in the film at all. There's just this one. I wish moment the audience could hear it. It's it's yeah. The, oh, I can play like it. A legitimately, yeah. like a slapstick whip when he <laughs> slips. That's so bizarre. It stands out from an otherwise very serious film. Yeah, I'll try and get it up. And oh, here we go. Okay, hopefully this comes out. <laughs> it's actually kind of quiet, but you can hear it. The whee! like a. <laughs> Definitely a cartoon sort of thing. Hearing it again. Is it an Easter egg? I, I, I'm really not sure. I don't think it's an Easter. Maybe it was used. Yeah, maybe it's in another Steven Spielberg movie, and this was the. T <laughs> it's just hearing it again. It's like, what are you doing in this film? I've seen two people say that's the cable. No. Would well, a cable no. make that sound? No, may like maybe it gets pulled back in. Are you? Is it? Are you sure? Well, when I, it gets yanked out, right? Because. That's what he's doing. He's holding on to it. Hmm. Like as it's getting yeah, like rewound, it's making that noise. I don't understand. Like I, I, I always thought it was uh, not in universe. Just you know. A, oh right, like a non-diegetic sound. I didn't think it was. Hmm. I mean, I guess it could be because someone else is saying it's it's the Dilophosaurus, right? Like in the background, it's like I don't know about that either. I don't so. think it would be that. It's always come across to me as just to be like, oh, there he goes. <laughs> there he goes, tumbling down the hill. Yeah, because if it was the if it was the wire, then the re-winching sound wouldn't happen until after like he lets go or something. But he has it here in his hands, doesn't he? So well, that's it's what extended, I'm saying. Maybe anything. Out of him holding onto it as he fell, but then I well, guess if he lets go, is it drawing back I in? I think it's and a that's slapstick kind of a... slip sound. That's what it uh, seems to me. I, I just don't. That doesn't feel quite right well, as the cable sound. I don't know. Yeah, I get you. Very quick too. It's not like a. It's a right, right, right. I need to. I'll Google what the sound actually was. I'll, I'll look up the sound guy and he can tell me what it really was. <laughs> if it was like a chihuahua passing it. gas or something, and he put it in the film. There's very specific thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if I suppose if it was supposed to be the cable, then fair enough. But I've always thought it was like a cartoon slip sound. Someone said it was foreshadowing for his part in Space Jam. Oh, oh yeah, yeah he's Space, Space Jam will come after this. He was, yes. He, he gets was. flattened mm. in that and then reinflated. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very normal movie. We should check it out sometime when you found movies. Um, <laughs> uh, are you going to make us watch the remake? Uh, the, sequel, the sequel. You mean. Yeah. yeah. The requel, maybe. Well, of uh, course. But yes, of if course. We'll watch one, I'm going to watch okay. the other. All right. Uh, so. We got us uh, him him gradually working to get his uh, car free of the wreckage of this, this Dilophosaurus, just playing with its food for a while, seemingly, or uh, trying to assess its potential danger. Obviously, because it wouldn't yeah know what to it's do. Like sizing it up, like I don't know, like you're a big, strange-looking creature. Mm -hmm. You know, you're brightly colored. You are not really afraid of me, but I can't quite tell. Yeah, it's it's just it's like. It's like the dog in The Last of Us, you know? What makes it's you like, wonder if you he... You don't know what he's thinking. If he took the jacket off and, like, waved it around in front of him, maybe it would scare it off. I don't know. But uh, he doesn't take it seriously. He, He's like, it'll be... I don't have any food. I got nothing on me. Leave me alone, sort of thing. Um, even tries to play fetch with it, which I think is very much a signal that he's underesting it, man, it significantly. Because, um, yeah, it's, uh, this scene goes... A little scary, a little fast. The uh, the whole like yeah, the, yeah. The, the the visual of it like spreading its um, I don't even know what body part thing they're called, but uh, pretty creepy. And then yeah, he gets flap thingies. <laughs> gets hit enough with this yeah. stuff, and earlier they did say it can uh, blind and paralyze. So um, yeah, making his way into the car is uh, the Dilophosaurus is already in there before he gets in as well. So it just eats him in the car, presumably. And I just love the shot where it pans down. Uh, yep. We see the Barbasol can just getting buried by mud. All of that, 
all of that scientific progress, all of that engineering, all of that technology and human innovation, and ultimately it's just back in the mud. Sort of, we're able to skip a, a couple of things. We've talked about some of these things, but the the wheel, the turning, the breaching of the branches, and the they've literally got like a this there's, there's something to be drawn out of this, right? Like a car crashing through a tree that's potentially going to kill them. It's like the yeah. tree is the only thing separating them from death right now. Kind of interesting. Yeah. I yeah, this so. climbing down. Through I mean, these the, are just uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, they're cool set pieces, really. They're just like really tension filled. Uh, and then they ratchet up dramatically at points. Like it's, um, this film knows how to sort of build up that tension in any given scene and then, you know, bring it to a really satisfying shot. payoff. I, hmm. Yeah, I'm I not sure, it. actually. Yeah. Um, because, know. well, first up, to, to what you were saying, right? It's like a lot of the uh, suspense and tension and uh, conflict in this movie. It's very small scale and believable. It's a guy and a boy, and they're trying to, you're just climbing away from a car, you know? And it's a fairly extended sequence. It's not super fast. Um, there, you have a lot of time to build up tension. Um, you have a lot of time to sort of just be aware of what's happening. It's not like part three in a series of 10 crazy wacky things that are just that are just total madness and it just keeps going and going and going and going you just have you just have time to breathe in this movie and there, there's this you know the, the, this kind of dread in the air of what you know bad things can happen speaking of next scene we have ellie and muldoon have reached this main area where it's broken out and they managed to find malcolm who I thought it was interesting that she notes about him that he's put a tunicate on his leg, like with his own belt. Yeah, and, and he's just gone back to just lying there. I think, which is uh... so I'd do. I wouldn't move a fucking muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just lay there. Well, imagine being him, like after everything he said, and now this has happened. It's just like what a fucking joke. <laughs> like, why is this <laughs> happening? This is yeah. uh, not fun. No, but yeah, he's got the belt on and the yeah. Remind me to thank John for a lovely weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, uh, a lot of funny things to say. When she says, "Can we chance moving him?" and he says, "Please chance it," because <laughs> they hear the T Rex. Yeah, yeah. Um, we get the. We've already had the cup with the water sort of footstep stuff, but now uh, it's the footstep with the footstep. That's what I mean. It's <laughs> like the hey, rather, they footprint. managed to up it aesthetically, which is really cool. And yeah, just, no, it's neat. And seeing him uh, reflected in it as well. It's such a he's just terrified and it really helps to sell the the horror portions of this. So I saw a couple of people um fighting over what exactly this qualifies genre wise. And it's like, well, I guess it is a couple moving in and around all of each other. Like uh people were trying oh, to argue back and forth right. whether it qualifies as sci fi. And it's like it probably should. Uh, it's just uh, how significant because because of what people think in their heads about what you'd expect from a sci-fi versus a horror versus a action adventure versus a th mm. thriller. I don't know if you could count portions of this as thriller, but you know, it doesn't doesn't really matter that much. It's more so just about how well, these things show up. All here. this highlights is uh, genre. We can we can just move past it and yeah. talk about what's happening in the film. But uh, yeah, Malcolm being uh, laid down Dinosaur in the back. Overboard. Uh. As they're driving, right? And it's just like, all you could do is basically be a free meal for it while you're sitting there. Yeah. So it's just terrifying <laughs> for him. Getting those screams and stuff. It's just like, yeah, they made, it's just a T-Rex chasing them. I say that, whenever I say that, you might think like, wait, what do you mean? I mean, oh, sorry. I mean in reference to like where it is now. Like, uh, they, if you remember promoting um, Fallen Kingdom and Dominion, I think, they kept talking about how they have a record-breaking amount of dinosaurs in the films. Huh. It's like, okay. I don't care. Yeah, like what? It's yeah. like this one has the most dinosaurs. Like, okay, you can do way more with the last guys. It's like commonality with these sorts of things. Well, it's it's a it's one of those uh, euphemisms that is said, but nobody ever listens to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ever. Less is more. It's like yes, but less can be more, and more is more. More is more. But more is more. <laughs> exactly. That's right. And yeah, uh, Alan is just like, fuck it, we'll stay up in this tree, it seems safe enough, and uh, they get to marvel at the Brachiosaurus having some fun in a big old hood. I don't even know, this would this be their paddock, or are they free? What is... 
Uh, I'm not, I don't know actually, but I presume that they're just roaming about the place. Um, well, I was going to say, they, sure. they must spend the majority of their time just eating, right? To sustain a body like that? Well, herbivores, I think so, yeah. yeah. That's what herbivores often do. Like, they're cows spend most of their all day all the eating. time. I do love these sharp contrasts of terror and beauty, though, throughout the film. Oh, you yeah. just had that insane encounter with the T-Rex to then be contrasted against this just beautiful moment. Just nature, you know, just observing nature, even if, even though it's, you know, probably shouldn't be in existence like this, there's still something beautiful about it. Does it not feel a little like we flipped in terms of uh, the beginning was all about the majesty and amazingness of everything. And then they like inject the characters talk about the horror element of it almost the you don't understand what you've done sort of thing. Now we're like exclusively in the horror section of the experience and we're pulling some nice beautiful things out while we can you know it's like a flip it, it just it keeps oscillating yeah it keeps oscillating between this is horrifying but still this is really cool isn't it but this is terrible yeah but still yeah ain't it neat um it's almost like it's on a meta level and it's reflected in the characters um but it's it's great for pacing as well after what was a pretty lengthy high uh intensity scene to just bring it back a little bit you know well, and to have Alan chilling out with the kids, and they're even telling jokes, and uh, asking him for like reassurance, uh, you know, about their safety, and it's just like, look at you go, mate. You're almost a dad. Yeah, naturally thrust into that role. He's doing a great job. Meanwhile, um... he's doing a pretty good job, all things considered. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's such a horrifying scenario, and you got to keep it together for the sake of them. That's the the job he has right now. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, the scene, I love the scene with Hammond and Ellie coming up now, and yes. I love as well the panning over all the imagery of the merchandising that's already begun for uh, this park and we mm -hmm. haven't even launched yet. Like, of course, that's how it works, it's just the, it's a reminder of... Those are very 90s water bottles. Yes, and uh, I want to appreciate the columns in this room that have little uh, fossils in them. I imagine not real ones, just... Uh, the fun is <laughs> and yeah with uh the fact they didn't find the kids he's um he's talking about how like you know it's, it's i'm sure they're fine they're with alan you know and he's the he's the best yeah, person dinosaur to be with. expert and he tells us about a little bit of his history to give you a really strong understanding of hammond as a whole right that uh he when he came down from scotland he um would have uh he ran a flea circus and uh, he's describing like all of the amazing elements sort of thing but that from his point of view, it's obviously all fake. The best you can do is temporarily convince people or even just sort of amuse them at the idea. And that he always wanted something more real, something that was you could reach out and touch, something that was actually there. And um, I really appreciate that that's like his big goal and you can finally offer the world that. But then her coming back with like, all of this is still fake. Uh, you've not actually appreciated what these things are or... I, I can't remember um, who I first heard this from, so I remember it just being an idea, but the uh, Hammond wants to show the world something real, something that's in its like originality. It's not like a joke or, a, or an illusion or anything, but he simultaneously doesn't want the animals to be bound by their nature. He wants them to conform to what he needs. Not yeah, about, it's, and... um, it's, you understand the track that gets him to this point because, in a sense, it's very, it's very understandable. Like it's it's um it's kind of a misguided appreciation for dinosaurs. I think I mentioned it earlier. Like when people are like, yeah, I want to pet that wild animal. It's like, yeah, you know, I get that there's some earnestness there, but you know, true respect for the animal is to like observe from a distance, leave it be. And in this case, it's like a reverence for dinosaurs means accepting that they don't exist anymore. And to observe them from a distance, or at the very least, if they were going to exist, not to like have them bound by the rules of a theme park. And yeah, just the desperate pleading with him that he's never really moved on from that flea circus. It's all uh, insane to think that you can create this place the way that you envisioned without having insane uh, repercussions in all all manners that they've covered throughout this film. And yeah, uh, and then it comes down to a fundamental that Ellie's just like, we just, we gotta save the people we love. We gotta, gotta get them. Yeah, like course... it just focuses in on what matters right now. Yeah, it's, uh, there's just so much 
to be considering, but ultimately what matters the most is like, well, we got to get them to safety. That's the actual thing. Fuck the park. And uh, but it's just obviously that's what is on his mind is that this this crazy experiment that he spent so much time and all of his life almost led to it's completely fallen apart. Exactly. Yeah, and it takes a little while for that to sink in. It eventually does, but it's understandable that it takes a while. Yeah. And uh, he's eating all the ice cream so that it doesn't go so much to waste because of all the power fuckery and the, the freezer will have melted a lot of the ice, so to speak. It's, it's a little bit of a clue as to what will be useful for other characters later. Mm. And then a dinosaur sneezes on the girl and it's funny. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like the, the the brachiosaurus is super cool and nice and friendly and then uh, you know it gives you a bit of reality okay snot comes with these things they have no uh, yeah it's a few million years behind on social decorum mm -hmm. yeah it is a bit mean I'm not sure that he did it on purpose though Nah, well, he did. <laughs> time, time. <laughs> he did. Did he or did he not? We gotta figure this out. <laughs> nice and gross. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, Alan finds a bunch of uh, broken eggs. So, it looks as if they've found a way. Or they made an omelette. Either. Oh, those must be expensive. Oh. A dinosaur omelette. That seems like, um... Just yet another, you know, piece of information relating to the illusion of control that they had here. You yeah, know, yeah, we control their breeding. <laughs> no, you don't, and you didn't even know. It's um, it's kind of funny. I would even cite the Jurassic World Evolution game that I've uh, played quite a few times. It's, it's all everything you do to make the park function. It's all like it's it's just what Ellie said. It's all like you're pretending as though you really have control when you really don't. Everything you do is an attempt to maintain like this long line of just trying to make everything function the way you want, but everything keeps going wrong, everything moves different ways cuz ultimately that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make it exactly the way you want it, but simultaneously for it to be itself. It's completely incompatible. And uh, it's just it's just tough to sort of learn fully because of course if we had hyper technology with intense thick steel on every single cage and like a really good way to view it all it's like you can definitely get it to that point, um, but the you know you're you're going to be it's, it's, it reminds me of all that stuff I don't know if you guys have seen I think it's called Blackfish the um the documentary no. about the worst of what's happened to like orcas throughout the world but you can get it so that you fully control them, but then you don't get them, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Like, at some point, you're changing it so much that you, you've you lost what it was that you were trying to retain. A lot of ships sank until we learned how to sail. That's probably a way to put this. <laughs> like, it's uh, hmm. kind of how things can go. Yeah, so their plan is to... Uh, they need to reset the system fully to get everything back online from when Nedry took it offline. Because they can't deal with his, like, I think they say his two billion lines of code. They need to sift through to find what he's done. And so instead, if you just reset the system, it'll all wake back up. But to do that, it turns everything off and then everything back on. And it triggers the uh, trip switch in their generator. Which means that they've got to trip that back before they can get everything back on. And that, of course, if you've been paying attention, means the raptor gates are down. Yep. And, oh, I uh, thought when you said Raptor Gate, I was like, there was some scandal happening involving the Velociraptors. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, oh, right, of course. Um, yeah, the, the, they bump into Gallimimus. And they even highlight that like they might do this kind of activity when being hunted, I think. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> then it's like, uh-huh. <laughs> like, then you might have a bit of concern. But to be fair, they, they seem to feel, at least Alan does, pretty safe. Because I guess the the T Rex is going to be much more invested in killing them than uh, the Gallimimus than them. Well, yeah. What what food source is, is preferable? Little people That's, or it's always bugged me in movies. Stuff. Yeah, like you have food right there. Why are you chasing some random things that are tinier and running away? It's like you have food right here to eat. Especially eat when it. animals there, there was a there was a real evolutionary incentive to to minimize how much energy you're using to do this. You know, you can't be expending too much effort. Bet you'll never look at birds the same way again. 
Maybe that's something they were hoping to achieve. Like, you'd always be scared of water with jaws, now you'd be scared of birds, because they're kind of like this big spooky T-Rex, huh? Like, they're just going to open up Bird Park next. You've seen Jurassic Park. Hunt. Now, Bird Park. And yeah, so there's this moment where um, Samuel Jackson's gone to go and sort out the trip switch, and he hasn't come back in time. So now they're, uh, they're worried about where he is, and it's kind of mm. weird, because he's, he's killed. Uh, um, and I think that's more than acceptable. It is the ob, I guess we'll get there, that I find to be absolutely hilarious. Sounds a bit silly, yeah. Um, so anyway, Ellie suggests that they go and do the trip switch themselves, and Muldoon this time is the one that says, I'll go with you. Kind of cool. They've made a, bit, made a good team before, right? And uh, yes, yeah, you got Hammond and Malcolm are going to try and guide them where they need to go to sort out the trip switch. Kind of makes you think, fuck it, should have probably gone with Arnold when he went, right? Um, I guess they figured it was safe. Potentially, I guess, yeah, I guess they thought he'd be able to do it. Um, but, well. Hmm. And yeah, there's this moment where um, uh, Hammond offers that he should go instead of Ellie. And the implication being because he's the man, she's a woman. And she says, uh, we'll talk about sexism in survival situations when I get back. And I just thought that was like, it's like, well, I give the guy some credit. He's basically offering. Yeah, he's as trying a, to be, you know, chivalrous. Because uh, it's obviously the better choice that you go than him. But he's still trying to offer it as like a, a sort of, you know, I want to want to look after those uh, those whamans when you're in specific circumstances. You Basically, should just be like, I appreciate that, but no way you're going to be able to outrun a Velociraptor or even have a chance, you know? Yeah, um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's something that I, I guess I appreciate the fact that they threw it in for Hammond that he was he would offer it. This yeah, is the thing, I mean, he's, not, he's, not some, like, he's not some asshole. He's no, a really nice, no friendly way. dude who just wants people to be happy and stuff. It's Because, uh... you know, the lawyer, he, he doesn't get to stay in the film for very long, but you, you wouldn't catch him doing any of this stuff. He would just be cowering in like a closet or whatever. Yeah, then she'd save him. I would save him. Wait, cowering a closet? I didn't mean to imply he's gay! <gasps> he should be bravely in a closet, proudly. But yeah, uh, it's kind of cool. You have this moment of them just walking towards the destination. Cabra sees uh, Ellie, and then she we, we pad over to Muldoon, and he's fucking frozen and sweating. And it's just like, yeah. you okay? And he's like, no. <laughs> We're being hunted. Yeah. It's like, oh. Yeah, and he basically uh, just tells her very calmly to fucking run. Get into that uh, generator building now. It's all right. Run. Just run. <laughs> <laughs> Get going. I'll stay out of here and uh, be a Chad. Deal with these uh, velociraptors. Yeah, that seems to be the uh, the angle. Hopefully she can do it. And uh, yeah, I guess Arnold went in there and a Velociraptor followed him in. That's what we would expect to happen, have happened, to make sense of that. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, around about the time they're planning on redoing these uh, fences, our uh, group of Alan and the two kids are getting out of the paddock they were uh, trapped in, I guess. Yeah. Which means there crossing a, over the... Electric fences are currently not operational. Though I like how he checks... Don't check by touching it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's a good idea. At it. That <laughs> would be that would be wise. You don't check to see if a gun's loaded by pointing it at yourself <laughs> and pulling the trigger. Yes, you do. Uh, this, <laughs> that's perfectly yeah, normal. This, uh, this bit of levity here as well. <laughs> yeah, it's such a prick move, but it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's and not funny. Shows, that was great. <laughs> shows how the difference, uh, yeah, the difference in the kids and how they react to you know. Yeah, he finds it funny, which is the correct. Uh, yeah. And it's um, also I also good. really appreciate yeah. him trying to pry open the little gaps to see if they can get through, which would be, you know, your natural kind of first attempt is to see, you know, can we fit through here? He it definitely then shows can't. gaps that are clearly large enough for the children to go through. Yeah, the um, ones he was playing with, I don't even think a child could get through, but unfortunately the no. ones that are clear, there's some the ones big at the ones. Bottom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ones at the bottom, they can clearly get through. And he says, you two go through here, I'll go up and over. Yeah, which would have solved um, their uh, incoming issue. Yes. Um, they can fit through there, yeah. Wait, someone said Alan knew the cable was safe because it was in the middle. Because it was in the middle? I don't know what they mean by that. 
I thought that this whole thing was wired up. Like, uh, touch any part yeah, that's of it why he and electrocute the... you. Well, yeah, he, that's why he looks at the lights. Yeah, I thought that... And even he, then, I have... He knew it was off because of uh, the test with the stick, and then... Yeah, I would imagine the one he touches is normally going to electrocute you. Yeah, and, and plus the sign, the danger oh, sign is right there. Oh, fuck, that's so. an ancient meme, I'm sorry. What? Oh, what are we... Oh, what are we Alan missing? with the middle is... Alan... Uh, Alan... Was... Alan! I know that the it wasn't even the Velociraptor behind, Alan. There's so then? many Alan. I think so. The biggest fan they were the, they they liked the middle the most, right? Oh, oh man. Oh, middle is a, I remember Mihai Cheek sent me high. I remember and that. How he says, you know, the, you know, the middle is we don't want things to end. Alan in the middle. Yeah, because it was something about Game of Thrones. Like the reason Game of Thrones was bad was because we all loved oh. the middle. We want the middle to go on forever. We don't want an end. Yeah, we don't want an end. Absolutely wrong. Uh, <laughs> like oh how my... stories work. Oh, man, that is an ancient meme. How far back was that? That's EFAP like... Oh, that that was the... um, What was that? That was the Wisecrack? I think it was Wisecrack. I, I, it's making me... Because th for some reason I'm connecting to this is my favorite part. I don't know if that was the same video. Um, I love that meme too. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about the, uh, yeah, that was Randy the Goblin. <laughs> yeah, he Randy gold, the Goblin. He wanted his gold ingots. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Because we covered like... Wisecrack talking about the Disney things, the Disney ruining culture. Uh, yeah, I'm that right was nostalgic where, right now for these things. Uh, Wisecrack on Game of Thrones having a chat with, uh, I think it was 46? Damn, that is an old Was that 46? Um, Go in, honey. I think... <laughs> I remember Joe, Joe and Honey. That was Joe and Honey. <laughs> I love gold. I love honey. Oh no, I'm in Honey. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> but oh wow. There was several animations made in relation oh, yeah, to Joe and Honey. Oh yeah, it was Walking Dead mobile game. Yes. This Walking Dead mobile game was what it was. Yeah. Gold. Oh yeah, I'm going to this <laughs> EF EF 46. Oh, good times. Wow, um, that was that was three years ago or so. So that is a on point meme reference. She reaches the switches, and this is particularly intense now because we know. I love this camera pan, by the way. It's so cool. But as we know, they are not off the fence yet, and they do believe they are safe. And then when she starts uh, charging it up to turn it on. I mean, that's really worth pointing out as an appreciation. A lot of writers wouldn't have done this, is having it so that there's a warning light first to let people know these things are turning on. It's like, hey, that yeah. sounds like a reasonable thing that a writer would happily leave out because it will cause uh, issues in terms of raising the tension. But uh, you managed to implement it well enough here that they know it and they now have to descend quickly because you can't just jump off. Um, but the thing is, uh, he's not fast enough. He just ain't, and he's getting all spooked. So it's uh, getting real close, and he actually gets Zapparoonied. And it would make me wonder, um, I don't think there's ever any overt reference to exactly how many volts are traveling through those things, but... Uh, 10, I think it's like 10,000. Yeah, on the warning yeah, sign it says 10,000. Oh, in that case, I guess, what happens to a human when they're hit by 10,000 volts? What's interesting is that as I go into Google and type in, can 10,000 volts, it autofills as, can 10,000 volts kill Jurassic Park? Kill Jurassic Park. Um, uh, you see, the electric fences required at least 10,000 volts of voltage to contain the dinosaurs properly. This is an assumption, as mention is made about whether or not direct current or alternating current was used. Also, it should be noted that it is, in fact, amperage, not voltage, that can lead to death by electrocution. Um, let's okay. see. It's, it's possible for something to have 10,000 volts behind it and be relatively harmless. Uh, it can be life-threatening under certain circumstances. And sure enough, here we go. Would Tim from Jurassic Park really have survived the shock? Um, let's see. Uh, it's difference in voltage, which creates large... That's that thing. Yeah, I think it's okay that he uh, survives this. I don't know about him flying back, though, but ultimately that... He does get caught, and matter. obviously people are referencing, it's like, well, his heart does stop. And it's like, no, yeah, of course, I was just curious if that's unusual compared to just dying. I wonder if it was just an insta-kill for people or not. Um, it says, if your body is only touching the fence wires, you wouldn't even feel it, at least not the sustained current. Because I guess it's like, when if you're being grounded or not, or why birds can land on, you know, power lines and not, you know, get exploded. Uh, 
The cables are lashed together with thinner metal wires. They're conductive, but in while they're thinner, they have much higher resistance per foot. Uh, carry on. I will uh, look and see. No problem. Well, someone in chat said voltage is the transport, amperage is the payload. So, um, hmm. these are not things I'm aware of, so I have to do some Googling. Wiki and... But, um, we've now got the, uh, the Muldoon scene, and it, it is incredibly tense. I believe this man fully believes that he is, uh, completely matched here and that he has to be careful with every single step but that he wasn't aware of hunting patterns for velociraptors when they are together or at the very least it caught him off guard and uh, the clever girl thing is just perfect meme format and i think yep. they have a puppet on him right animatronic potential eating him quote unquote but they put like leaves and and stuff in place so that it uh, it can just the confusion of what we're seeing is good enough with his screams, basically. And I love the shot of the other Velociraptor just watching. Brilliant. Yeah, nice and ominous. So he's out. Even when being careful, you can still fail. Very true. That's right. And he was very close. He got a shot off, but it missed. So it was very close. Um, by the way, this says here, uh, what happens if Tim is shocked and receives the injuries that are shown in the film? Okay, now he's almost certainly dead because his heart apparently stopped. We'll give Grant the benefit of the doubt here and assume that he wouldn't give a small child who you might already have broken ribs from the fall he just sustained chest compressions unnecessarily. Unfortunately, people who need CPR generally don't just go back to normal in a few minutes. CPR keeps you alive long enough to get medical attention, which in this case wasn't available in a reasonable time frame. Oh, okay. Also, it will it will be noted that if someone's heart isn't working, um, it's better that they get broken ribs than have their heart not work. A B C. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's that's the uh, that's that's what it is with CPR, right? There is a real good risk that you can break someone's ribs doing it, but yeah, I mean, you want to break that a heart rib, you is want more important. Dead. Ribs yeah. can they'll they'll mend, they'll grow back. Your if your heart stops, stupid ribs, uh, get out of the way. Get out of the way. Um, I think right when we watched it, you highlighted like uh, Grant comes across Ellie, and when he sees her, she has a very dramatic delivery of "run" that she keeps like under her breath, so to speak, almost. Yeah. And then they she says, run. collect up, they hug, and I think you were like, "run." <laughs> like that's, yeah, that's yeah. What, what were, are we? Are we not running? Are we okay now? I guess. I guess not. Maybe. She I get was, that she's just, desperate, like, especially panicked. if she knows what happened to Muldoon. But uh, you know, it's just funny. It's like. Running to the safety of Alan. It's like, no, 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 not safe, not safe. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Alan's pretty great, but I don't know if he's, like, dinosaur resistant. You know? <laughs> dinosaur resistant? What does that look like? It I don't tries... know. Eventually the dinosaur will get you, but, you know, it'll, it'll you know. So someone not was quite wondering, dinosaur proof yet. Do you guys think it was deliberate that they had the lunch scene right after they saw the feeding scene for the Velociraptor? And then... They're enjoying, indulging in all the desserts here, like, happily eating, so to speak. And then we see the Velociraptors are here as well. Like, they're here, it's sort of, in a way, it's like they're here for the same reason that you are there right now eating. It's just the uh, reflections, I guess, of, because um, they, they have it quite close together, the ferocious nature of destroying that feeder. And then it cuts to, like, the meal and the plate being placed for them at lunchtime. And I was like, I wonder if that's on purpose as well. That humans of um, our desires and designs almost separate us from the animal kingdom happily, but that uh, that is still ultimately what we are. Still doing the exact same thing as the Velociraptors. Maybe, yeah. Because um, something so I don't good. like is when they treat dinosaurs as good or evil in this franchise. Like, um, yeah, those are the good hero critters, ones, yeah. and those are the non-hero ones, and gosh darn do I love it when that hero T-Rex takes out the villain of the film. It's like, what? What is it? What are you, like like like? Yay! He did it. Good T Rex or <laughs> something. It's just like no, the animals. They're just they're doing what they're doing because they're hungry and they want to survive and they've been built that way. Like I I, just, I don't like going further than that. I think it's silly. Yeah. Um. The the whole thing they tried to do with Blue being trained and everything. Oh, was like, fucking that, Blue. That was shit. Because because Blue was like <laughs> it's almost instantly reverted back to a ferocious wild animal and tried to kill. But is like they. No, you can, is, is is blue trained and friendly or not? Quit going back and forth. I hate blue. <laughs> like it's so I hate annoying blue as well. Blue should have oh so close to fucking dying. Yeah, Had that one chick do like a blood transfusion for the dinosaur. And oh like, my fuck god! Off. Yeah, 
One gunshot nearly killed it. So fucking close. Dude, it's such a like, how did we get here? <laughs> like, what is this disaster? You know what's crazy, by the way? I'm looking at the timeline. It's like, all right, this sequence with the Velociraptors is about to begin. And it's like, wait, we've only got like 15, 10 yeah, minutes of movie film left? Is, film is real close to being, to it's ending at this point. So dense. They get so much shit done. Because if you had yeah, told me how much time like passes. like you're only halfway into it. How much time passes in from those Velociraptors to the credits? I'd be like, 20 minutes? 25? Nope. Like, nope, way less than that. Because well, again, this... you know, the the T-Rex, we don't see him until over an hour in, like just over an hour. Oh, and I I guess I'll, I'll, I'll address it because I just, I don't know. But apparently these, accurately speaking, are not velociraptors. They are a different kind of raptor. Um, and Utah it's a, raptors? Or, Utah, it's like um, Utah raptors or Utah raptors. Utah raptors. Utah they raptor. Utah raptors. Does no, I know, but... Utah, oh, these or... ones have feathers. Uh, it means Utah's predator. Uh, it's one word, Utah raptor. I thought like it might be. So, to Utah. clarify, they're not from the state of Utah. Well, I, I don't Okay, know. well, I guess we'll have to, we're left to speculate on that one, then. I don't oh, know. It looks, like the, it looks like the Utah raptors. Oh, the here, let me get you a picture of the, the, the Utah raptor. Okay. He's a, he's a cool one. He's one of the bird boys. Look at him. Well, yeah, maybe this is a hot take, but when I see the illustrations of the of like raptors that look more like birds, I prefer those two. You could easily make these lads terrifying. I don't think we have. There's any no way. Yeah, yeah, look at the look at the claws and the teeth, and yeah, I mean, you, especially well, if it like plumes up or something to make itself look bigger, that can be terrifying. I uh, I do really like the designs of all the dinosaurs in this film. I think they look cool. I will say yes. that I do have a preference personally for the more bird-like illustrations that I've seen of Velociraptors. Um, not because I'm a bird, just because I think they look neat. Mm -hmm. uh... There is there is something about... it's it, There's something about things being almost... I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, it's weird how I'm, I'm kind of thinking about how to phrase it. When things don't look perfect or look aesthetic in a way that makes them look better it, because it doesn't seem like you're trying... To make them look a certain way, like that's just it as it is. It's like it's like some how some like Russian rifles and stuff are really ugly, sort of looking, well, but that almost makes so them appealing because they look like in, they're pure utility. In defense of the well, I does the film? Did we have a? Did we have this sort of understanding of what they could look like when this film was made? I don't know because I, I don't know if we. I don't know that I we thought... do, which I find interesting is that our perception of dinosaurs and what they look like has just changed the more that we've learned about them. Yeah, I could be um, wrong, but what I thought was when this film was made, this was the presumed science, the, the, uh, the leading theory. That's what theories, I'm saying, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm seeing some people say yes and some people say no. Oh, feathers weren't discovered yet? Uh, that's, yeah. because I think I that's what I've heard. The, the imprints of like that on some of the fossils that they found, there's just markings on the bones that have led them to conclude uh, the the whole feather aspect. And then, dude, just I'm sure plenty of people here have watched it. The Kurzgesagt video on what dinosaurs may have actually looked like is uh, super cool. That's a real interesting one in terms of trying to get you to rethink, um, you know, perceptions of, of what dinosaurs may have looked like. Uh, and a few people are saying, watch Prehistoric Planet, which, yeah, I'll have to throw that on the list. <laughs> but we got the Velociraptor scene now. Yes, and I love that, uh, she's closed the door on it in that generator room, and he's like, so, there's only the two we gotta deal with, right? And then she's like, well, yeah, unless they can figure out how to open doors. Yeah. And it's like, uh, about that. <laughs> <laughs> that cuts in, but I love him breathing on the glass as well. Yeah, we were talking about these sort of micro interactions with the real world. And there are some things you may forget when you're working with an animatronic because you're like, I've got it. This is the real thing. Done. And then it's like, if people on set are there and, and, and in the work to be like, well, I mean, if it breathed real hard and it was hot breath and it went onto the glass, it would do this. Let's make it do this. Yeah. It's really cool. That'd be neat. Um, yeah, this it looks so good. Look at that. <laughs> the eye and it looking around. I love the, the it just looks the so lenses good. Lenses and the 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 lids closing <laughs> the around the narrowing it's... lids. I know yeah. it. 
Uh, uh, it's so cool to watch. <laughs> way the lips, yeah, pull back a little bit. This is why, by the, the way, I refuse. To, like, I find it interesting when it's fiction, when it's nonsense, like not uh, not nonsense, but not real. Um, meanwhile, like I ask, people get bored of dinosaurs. I just nah. I I'd nah. love to see these fuckers. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but then I feel bad because I'd be like, oh no, I watched Jurassic Park. I remember the message of that. Oh dear, I'll be having them in little boxes. And then it's now, like, you might no. remember Jurassic Park, but I have a question. Do you remember Disney's 2000 dinosaur? film, Dinosaur? Yeah. I saw it I once, remember it? and it's I been too long for me to remember it. it anymore. I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> no, we had that shit on, I don't know, VHS, DVD, whatever it was. Uh, growing up, I saw that more than once. I don't know if it's good or not. <laughs> I don't know if it's good know. or not. It had, a bunch of, it had a bunch of lemurs in it. Well, you know what? That's good. Maybe. <laughs> Why is uh, cracking lemurs in my dinosaur movie? Yeah, like the... Move it, move it. We watch the yeah. raptors open up the door and they come. And we're switching between practical and CG quite a bit in this scene. And uh, you know they were trying to make it seamless. And I appreciate every last effort. I think they did a great job. Uh, I love them. I think I they're fantastic. So, I was so impressed. And like the lighting on the CG as well, it's like wow, man! And the details, like it's all some... of the little, you know, uh, like what can you even say? Like I, I don't expect to ever see this ever again. I don't expect when we watch well, any movie crazy. again that I'll see this. It's like that's really sad. Yeah, How I'll just pass it to the CGI you know? guys, and the characters will suck, and I'll be like, when can I go home? Well, the thing is, they'll pass it to the CGI guys. It's like, so can we have four years like James Cameron gave us? <laughs> 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 Oh wait, you're serious? Because <laughs> like... like the, the in in the scene that just showed a moment ago, like the two Velociraptors standing in the doorway, like those were CGI. Yeah. But like they look pretty darn good. Well, it's, mm. it seems to me that they only ever use CGI when they have no option to do. When they can't show the body, practical. yeah, because they have the feet, they have the heads, they have the little hands. But yeah, when they have to do a full body, yeah. yeah. Well, Rags, you pointed That's out when we were watching it, and I'm the exact same. It's like burned into my memory the the feet going across the ground and the the click clack the taps clock on the tapping yeah. on the yeah because it, you, you we see them because the way it's directed and shot right you have the big table and a bunch of shit in the table right so you can't see through the table but underneath it you can see the feet and the claws uh, from above you can see the head and then you can have the tail kind of wiggling around behind yeah, it yeah so. Yeah. You don't have to see the body to have the scene completely and totally work. You see all the really dangerous bits, mm -hmm. um, and that's like enough to totally sell you on it. Because moments ago, you saw the CGI of the full body, so your mind doesn't even think about, oh yeah, of course, there's a body. Like, well, duh, there's, it's just the, the table's in between us and the body. And so it, it's just, it, it's the direction paired with the good animatronics paired with the, the wise use of CGI. Yeah, because there are like some here, shots. You saw the CGI there of them, and it's like what two seconds, and yeah, here and... it's like what going to be four, five seconds, and then whoop, we're already moving on. And to have done it practically would have been a nightmare when they like full body. It would have looked. Uh, it, they're not that good. You can do if, if you put a lot of work and effort into making heads, claws, um, you know, a tail. You can do that, but to make the whole thing walk around, that's just the technology's just not, you know, quite. You're not going to get something else. the movement that you want um, for them yeah. running around. Yeah, and she goes to climb into like a, a dumb <laughs> yeah, and, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is it a just a shelf, yeah, or something like that? But it reflects off the, uh, the... The thing is, you're given all the information to know that she is not where it looks like she is, but you can forget that when you see it run into water. <laughs> Like, it's uh, so good. It's very much <laughs> described in the scene. Like you can see her getting in. You know that she's not where the, she then looks like she is. But it's enough to like. I think a lot. Yeah, of, you see her. Yeah, the hole right there. Yeah. Um. But you see, it, you're like, oh fuck, is she is she fucked? Is she gonna be able to close it in time? And you're like, well, she's fine because it can't actually get her by going that way. And it's just a, it's cool. Well, there's that element of like, oh, you were fooled as an audience member, which you, you probably were. It's like, yeah, the, the raptors aren't so dumb, are they? Because it fooled you too. They thought you just thought exactly what they did. How about that, huh? And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> give him a little credit. He runs in to the freezer, immediately chased by the raptor, and he grabs onto, like, I think a pole so he can swing himself to not, like, fling right into the freezer. But of course, the raptor can't, and it just slides right in because 
yeah, with the power having gone off for so long, things were melted in there, so it's all slippery. It's a little set up and pay off, and there's exactly. a lot of those nice little moments in there. There's no, like, big dramatic set up and payoff, which is a lot of small... Well, I mean, just setting up, like, you know, several minutes beforehand. Character, there's plenty. And I don't know if one would call this... It's, it's such a strange environment, right? Basically, he's got it locked in, but he hasn't quite got it full. And she knows that this is incredibly desperate. This is your chance to be able to get the raptor stuck in it. So she's fucking screaming her ass off as she runs to it. And I've always found it a little bit funny. Like It is. <laughs> <laughs> like, get the, this fucker the stuck out. in there. It's yeah, the hands forward. Yeah, that yeah, is that's good. <laughs> so, super desperate and tense. Because this is your one shot. Gotta get it right. And yeah, so that one's locked in. But of course, the third they thought they'd locked in another place is... Uh, to break out. Well, probably has, actually. I don't think they show that happening. But yeah, you get them running away, and it's just like this shot of the lost raptor staring at him. It's fucking great again. It's just a... Uh... They they, <laughs> so they spend Jesus. the whole film building up the velociraptors, and now we've got them, but they're fucking great. And now you're running for your life from them in a kitchen. Yeah, and then uh, they get into the control room. We've got to get that system to reboot. And seriously, running out of characters at this point. <laughs> And, uh, oh, this shot where he notices the door isn't locked, pads back up, and the Velociraptor's just staring at him. And then they both look <laughs> down at the handle. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking terrifying. It's like, wait a minute, this isn't supposed to be a thing. It's, it's, it's scary to see a handle turn from the other side, you know, when you're not touching it. Like, that's that's scary. That's a Especially scary one Because there's a thing. fucking Walks dinosaur on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> yeah. Like, there are dinosaurs chasing us and opening doors. What the fuck oh, oh, is this place? It's just so ready to eat them. <laughs> it's like, you're making me work so hard to eat you. I <laughs> heard there was Chilean sea Opel. bass in there, and you're not sharing. I remember the Chilean <laughs> sea bass. So yeah, um, I guess the one thing you could say, because you did highlight the line, Rags, that she's like, uh, if I basically, if I go to get the gun, I can't continue to hold the door. But um, yes. I suppose she could have uh, yeah. uh, told Timmy to grab it for him. Um, so what she said before this was, you can't hold it without me. Or like, you need me to, it's like, I got to hold this with you. Um, so I don't know if Timmy would be strong enough. Which does kind of call into question no, no, no. how he was able to... I mean him to pick up the gun and give it to her. Um, or Alan. I guess, yeah. I wonder if she's even thinking about that in the moment. Um, that is I guess one she's thing like, oh, I would allow kid. for, the panic of it all. Is, the uh... panic, and the kids are over by the computer trying to it, do the thing. I guess they're working together, and I'm just so focused on keeping this door shut um, that it, it doesn't can... even occur to me to ask Timmy. It's a, it's, it's a thing that's uh, happened to me in video games sometimes where it'll be like an intense battle that's going back and forth, back and forth, and I'm like about to die, do die, and then it's like, you had a full heal. It's like, oh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it happens. Your character has, like, things. two abilities, and if you just used them, you would have been okay. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Whoops. Like, But I was just so ingrained in the moment. I wasn't even thinking about, like, using an ability or using an item. And I you can argue that so Ellie believes at that point that the two of them are trying to get the system rebooted. Absolutely. Um, which is quite funny visually, by the way. This insane, like, database is, is visualized almost like a cartoon motherboard or something. Windows 96? What is it? Windows 91? Whatever it is. No, I'm not oh, sure. This is before Windows 95. Windows yeah. 88? We were talking about it before. It's like, oh, look at the 3D graphics here as you sort through your files. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah. Can you give me this file? Yeah, sure. Let me fly over here. It'll be three minutes. Let me minutes, fly but, yeah. on my very old computer with these 3D renders in real time. <laughs> so like, it's a Unix system. She knows this. She's like, I know this. <laughs> and it's, it's funny. I think, Ryze, you mentioned it's just like the way you show it with the mouse. Like, you've never used a mouse before. <laughs> like, you've never used a mouse before. I, you look, are not. You're a fake gamer girl. Like, you've been detected. Retail computers. All right. Look, it was early. <laughs> just, uh... The way she's because, uh, yeah, there's just a way people hold, but she's like uh, using <laughs> like the don't. thumb as a full control <laughs> over them. It's yeah. so strange. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the door locks up, it's all good. We made it, folks. And then uh, they call back, and we have some fun lines about like, you know, Mr. Habit, the phones are wicked. I think uh, this is probably the most badass he comes across as well, Alan. 
Like the, yeah. the blood on his face, the gutted head. It's just like, get the damn helicopters. But uh, we hear a smash, and I assume that is the Velociraptor they thought was neutralized. Or at least in the um the place with near Muldoon, the generator, and so it's uh. in. And uh, and I they have this shot of the gun. I meant to look at this again because I wasn't sure if they were trying to tell us it, he's out of shots or if it's jammed. Or jammed? Um, I don't. We hear like three or four, and the way that it's on the ground looks like it's kind of deliberately that way. Um, because yeah, the because there's a shell. I mean, I, it could be uh, jammed and uh, he just, just dropped it, or he could be out. Um, but you wouldn't know that you were out. So. The way that it looks to me is that it was like a failure to eject, but if you just flip the gun over to the right, it sort of falls out, and you don't know that you're out until you... Um, I, I, I don't know specifically what you know the SPAS-12 mechanism uses, but, you know, of course, you, you press the, you know, the, the, the... pull the trigger, and the, there's a click, and you don't get anything, but... Um, yeah, the spent casing's there, very neatly, all next to the gun. But I don't know. I guess for whatever reason, the gun is either uh, not working or it's out of ammunition. My assessment would be we saw three holes in the glass. There's two shells on the floor and one stuck in the gun, seemingly. So it didn't eject properly, and he gave up on the gun when that happened. Really, uh, the most relevant part of this scene is 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 Hammond's face. Oh, it's... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a shame that your video has now made that a meme to me. Also, interesting, someone we'll just chat, uh, chat about it, I think that's actually, when they show everyone reacting to the Velociraptor coming, I'm not sure if, let me check again, I don't know if you can see Ellie saying it, but she says, oh, it's gonna cut through the glass. Yeah, you can't see her saying it, I think they would have thrown that in as ADR to, you know, assuage anyone being like, how's it getting through the glass? Like uh, it's, I guess it's just it, it seems like a, it or bashing its head or just yeah it feels like an overcorrection I mean, it's like don't worry I can believe it can get through glass I think yeah yeah absolutely a person can get through glass um, see if only if only Grant had the model eighteen eighty nine Akimbo he would have been he would have been, been fine, that's yeah. true I been... can't believe that they put that I love that game but like holy shit like <laughs> that you have shotguns as a secondary and one of your options for your secondary shotgun is a Kimbo for the shotgun. So you have two shotguns instead of one. I mean, the Spaz-12 was it, in Modern Warfare 2. It the Spaz-12 um, was insanely good as well as a secondary. Very just long range time. on it, yeah. Oh, someone to, said, and then Black Ops. It's bad subtitle, and she actually shouts, it's coming through the glass, which seems more reasonable, yeah. In terms of, like, less... It's, that comes across as less overcompensating and more normal. Uh, in terms of making sure people understand how this is happening, sort of thing. And yeah, we get... Uh, uh, Hammond looks like he believes right now that his grandchildren might die. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the most intense reaction you get out of him in the whole movie, and it's very much appropriate. Yep, he it's not because terrified. his park is failing, it's not because nope, the exactly, dinosaurs are loose, exactly. it's because he thinks his kids are in danger. The more, the longer the film goes on, the more localized his concerns become. Yeah. It's great. Well, Ellie talked to him about like, who we love is what matters now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we get the Velociraptor searching for him, and then it pokes up the thing. And like I said, uh, you start with animatronic with his head, gets kicked, and then when we see him again, he's full CG. And uh, we, we were looking at it for a little bit when we watched this, because I was just so thoroughly impressed with it. And it's, it's, it, we came down to it, it's got to be the animation. It's what uh, makes this so believable. Animation, animation is so important. It seems... Whenever I really notice CGI when it comes to, like, character, you know, it's it's always seems to be, man, you, you seem very light. You don't, you don't seem very weighty. You, I don't feel yeah. like you have I much heft. I mean, the dinosaur is way less, dis uh, way less distracting than the stunt double. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh... I think uh, the the kick uh, that was mentioned, Rags, is like, it, it, it like, uh, sort of changes the balance of weight so it can get back up. Like that helps as well. It just looks yeah, fast. It's the, yeah, yeah, it's the it's really the movement. Detail. It's the way it moves, it, and it moves in a way where it's quick, not too quick. You could tell it has a, an amount of weight to it. Um, yeah, it, it kicks the, so it could kind of get it back on its feet. It's it's just it just looks so good for it's CG. It's a complete 
100% totally CGI dinosaur in a 1993 movie, and it really looks good, and it's terrifying. This is the um almost the opposite of what you get in, in Ant-Man, where you can tell when really looking into it how detailed the graphics are, right? Which is something I guess you could be critical of, but that's actually where I would bring in, like, this is the most they can do. They literally can't do more. Like, uh... Some, can you see how like parts of it have to stretch instead of what looks like it doesn't look quite like skin it instead looks like a an image it's like a uh, stretching for very specific parts of the body this is what i mean you have to go mainly uh, the oh leg. yeah you got to look really yeah. closely yeah meanwhile the animations I mean, are so yeah, damn nice good actually. that it it doesn't even come to mind and then you have ant-man which will be close, like yeah. they'll have fucking top notch resolution and and High tech fidelity in every way, shape, and form, but the animation is so bad you'll never believe yeah, it. <laughs> the big problem with the 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 Cassie running is not like the fidelity of the suit; it's the animation. It it just looks goofy, and it's something that's so clearly important for the fact that everyone sees well, it and immediately laughs. And it's like, oh, well, it's, I think it's um the reason why video games often seem as though they look better than they actually because you know like video games being rendered in real time on consumer grade hardware it's it's never going to look as good as the best that you can do with visual effects at the time but yet people will often compare stuff like ant-man to like a playstation 3 game it's like well why is that ps3 games like don't have as, as high quality textures they can't and it's like, well you know you play uncharted 3 it's like the animation's really good like the animation does a lot of work for you like, if you, you animate a character in a way that, like, seems convincing, that can overcome, like, the pure fidelity of it. And yeah, them cycling through the, uh, the upper levels gets them being able to come down onto the fossil sort of yeah. uh, <laughs> representations of these important dinosaurs in the main hall, which is just like, ah, oh, what a great place for a set piece. Literally hanging onto the fossils for safety. Let Again, me ask this, is it a problem with the movie that the Velociraptor is able to get high enough to stick its head through the panels in the ceiling, but it can't jump high enough to grab her leg? Yeah, that doesn't, I didn't even think of that, that doesn't really make much sense. Yeah. I don't think it has much of a consequence as a problem, though. Maybe it's standing on though. a desk or something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe. I, uh, if you look around the room, see if there is a potential for that. That could be it. Yeah, I don't know if it's, it's, if it's standing on anything taller or the room has a bunch of tables and stuff it could be on, but... But yeah, uh, I quite love this sequence for just the absolute chaos. All these different pieces are all coming apart. Everyone's trying to hang on to each of them, and then the strings are coming apart gradually as well with the Velociraptors moving around. One has jumped on, and one's on the bottom, right? They're all just just so much happening all at once. And even the individual pieces are knocking the others. can't imagine in the, for a Velociraptor's brain how it's processing all this madness. It just wants to eat, up. man. <laughs> it's like, I'm hungry. These hamburgers are weird. Or there's no meat on these big ones. I can eat all these little boys. And yeah, uh, once they're all down, you just get Ellie like staring at the the silhouette of the Velociraptor, and it pokes his head up like, ah, oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> it's like, oh fuck. Yeah, and then the other one's in, and so it's just game over basically, because there's nowhere else to go. But something to appreciate is that Alan keeps himself in front of everybody. He's a good lad. I'll punch you in the face. And then, right as the raft is about to pounce at him, Hero T-Rex comes in and grabs the uh, <laughs> grabs the boss raptor, which is uh, timing is perfection. Apparently, like it, I'm, I'm highlighting how uh, lucky they are. And um, and the, nobody heard it. This is the, <laughs> I was saying to Rags. I don't know why they did it that way. I think it would have been yeah. perfect during the tense scene to have to the building up sound. Up. Not even show him soon, yeah. but just have those sounds. The doom. Doom. Yeah, while everything's the bones happening, on the floor can rattle just very subtly, and then maybe, maybe they just sort of they turn their heads to look at something off screen, uh, and then as the raptor pounces, you know, it gets grabbed. Like they, like the Grant and crew are distracted by the T Rex walking in, that they don't really look at the, uh, they they turn away from the Velociraptor for a moment, just to imply that they just noticed it showed up. Well, and you could even do a different kind of shot where the two Velociraptors are moving in, Grant's looking at both of them, and then we have the shot of him looking to the center almost and up and terrified, then both the Velociraptors turn and look because they haven't realized it yeah. yet either. And, or uh, the Velociraptors are maybe in front of them, and then the T-Rex comes from behind and they scurry away from the middle as the dinosaurs like start going after each other or something. Yeah. 
something, you know. But yeah, it, it is kind of um, strange <laughs> how it just. Well, and this shows this, up. by the way, is the origin of Hero T Rex. Uh, I don't I don't particularly mind him attacking raptors. Uh, that's fine. But uh, he ends They're up killing the yeah. villain humans in like all the fucking films. Like Lost World starts that up. Yeah, but it's, yeah. It's because of this movie, I think, that they did that. Like the villain in uh oh, well, I guess yeah, T Rex killed the the Indominus Rex, kind of. Um, I well, so I was say, yeah, Lost World T Rex kills businessman guy. Yeah. Um, I don't think they do it in Jurassic Park three because the T Rex is killed by the Spinosaurus to be like, look, Spinosaurus is scarier, and it's like, okay. I remember if fans were so. very upset by that, by the way. People like the T Rex. <laughs> they don't. Really like the T Rex. He's cool. Well, it's just funny because I don't. If you show a Spinosaurus okay. beating a T Rex, unless I know different from like biology or history or whatever as to which would win the fight, I don't have like a stake in T Rex to the point where I don't want him to see see him lose to anyone. You know, he's, he's just it's an animal. It can be killed, sure. Um, but I remember people were very much upset to uh, see the T Rex defeated by the Spinosaurus, especially because I think the goal filmmaking wise was to be like. See, Spinosaurus is scarier. You should be more scared of him. Um, but I haven't seen that movie in so long that I can't even say more than that. But yes, the T-Rex is um, summoned like Iron Man in Jurassic World to help like an actual superhero type situation where they're dealing with the Indominus Rex. And it's like, the T-Rex and the Mosasaurus essentially team up to kill him, right? You could argue. Mm. And then... Fallen Kingdom, the T-Rex eats the villain again. It's uh, kind of like Lost World. And I don't know about Dominion, but I assume the T-Rex has hero moments in that as well. Uh, I don't know, I just find it lame. It was cool the first time, alright? Well, so this is what I mean. I don't really see the problem. That element isn't here with this. The T-Rex is just eating the Velociraptor. Yeah, well, yeah. It's a, it's a hero just from a point of view that it helped you out. But, like, it's not doing it because it wants to help well, you. Well, they need to get the fuck just out because he will eat them next. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's exactly. not. It exactly. seems much more neutral in that regard. Um, but, yeah, they get out and he's like, uh, Mr. Hammond, I've decided like, not to oh, endorse you your park. No, I know, you know but I wanted to mention the... Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we, we did kind of talk about uh, the it, banner, right? Oh, I think Robert so mentioned good, it. Though. Look at him! Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, you're right. It, it is it is fantastic. Oh, and uh, honorable mention to the second raptor jumping onto the T-Rex. Uh, that's pretty Chad. It's a shame that it didn't work out. <laughs> that's Chad, but I... it Yeah, there's a Chad move, but I'm not certain how you thought this would end. <laughs> He's hoping for the best, I suppose. Um, yeah, I... Uh, I like that quote from Alan because it's like we fucking finally Alan. did it after all those efforts and he's just summarizing it in a very no. calm and civil way. Yeah, no. Um yeah. but the <laughs> the thing that I think almost makes it even better is the fact that he says uh neither neither am I. Like I'm not endorsing yeah. it either. It's like, hey, we got there. We got this arc. You know what? Nah. <laughs> yeah, this was uh was a mistake. This was an error. And yeah, that's um I think Pretty much for the rest of the film, it's just they leave. Yeah, that's, that's it. those that's are the, the final words of the film, I think. The rest of it is just reactions, uh, them getting on the helicopter and the way that each of them are sort of just, you know, looking as they're reflecting on their experience. And yeah, it's as if it's almost like a recognition of once this guy thinks it's a mistake, that's that that's, that like that's it. Dead, There's yeah. not really anything else needs to be said, like that's the end. Well, it's uh, Hammond's hopes and dreams have all been shattered, and he's had to realize a lot of realities he didn't want or need to be true for him, but it's mm, uh, not undeniable. Look. Yeah, look at him there, looking at the uh, the mosquito in the, in the sap. Such a great shot. So many. We didn't even see what Hammond was looking at, but he was just looking out. I mean, in the shot before that, where he's uh, on that landing pad. You know he's just looking over at the island, all of it. It's just, that was a mess. So much for that sort of thing. We get Ellie looking uh, surprisingly chill, almost happy, and it's because she's seeing Alan with the two kids. Remember, she's she's made a couple comments about how she's hoping to have a kid, and uh, uh, it's just a nice little completion of that arc as well. Yep, and then you've got a. Uh... You've got Malcolm sitting off uh, to the side. Malcolm Pretty, who's uh... not in the middle. No, oh. no, but no, he's uh, he's quite quiet and uh, melancholy as well. Sort of someone like, else pointed the out. thing is, he no was just is, correct uh, about everything, so you can yeah, just well, you can sit back, you've done your work. Someone in chat's pointing out that no one is celebrating. It's a somber moment when they escape. They're well, not no, going, because... we did it, woohoo. 
lot of people died um yep. and it's, yeah. it feels like it's reflected this was this was a bad day it's just relief if anything it's over mm -hmm. and not a word necessary and then yes we got that shot there of the birds flying along which uh yeah i mean another instance of something where it's like that's very deliberate you can read into that what you want just life being life isn't it yeah that's what all of this was that's why it went all wrong I mean, mm -hmm. references to how dinosaurs are essentially became birds, you became know, you get birds. These birds that, yeah. you know, yeah. and they're out there, you know, dinosaurs are still out there in, in, in a way, anyway, you know, in a sense, mm. in a way. Oh, and this last shot of the helicopter riding off into Directed the sunset, look Steven at that. Spielberg. Good, man. It, isn't it crazy how many, like, of the best films ever made Steven Spielberg has made? Isn't that nuts? He's behind quite a few. Uh Yeah. Well, this is funny because um, we were hanging out a bit with Gary as well when we were talking about this movie, and it's it's like my pick for his movies is going to be Saving Private Ryan, but it's not Jurassic Park is not far away. I fucking adore this film, and it's funny because uh, uh, Gary was saying like uh, he was talking about Close Encounters of the Third Kind, how much he loves it, and I was like, oh, is that your favorite? And he was like, no, it's Raiders. And I was just like, oh fuck yeah, of course he made Raiders yeah, as well. Yeah, and then of course <laughs> Shin was list as well. He yep. made um, it's it's uh, Jaws. It's, uh, he's Last got... Crusade. Oh, of course, that would be my favorite of those three. It's... That's my favorite, I think. Yeah. yeah. Wait, would that be your favorite Spielberg film? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. It's We're not certain, but yeah. definitely pencil it in. Mine is Saving Private Ryan. 